Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to episode number 28 of the Talking Perspectives podcast. We are, of course, the official podcast of the so- Sonic Perspectives vast media empire. Uh, and uh, Joel, unfortunately, cannot join us tonight because he is a responsible adult and has about 15 children to take care of. So in his stead, my old friend Matt Harper from Dallas is joining us tonight. Say hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hey, Matt. How many times have you been to Prague Power? I have been to Prague Power 19 times. Wow. That is nine more times than I've been. <laughs> and uh, and also, uh, returning from our previous episode, we've got uh, Samantha Buckman in the D.C. area. Howdy. Alexa O'Hara off in Seattle. Hey. And Brian Paxton in Detroit. Howdy. Thank you all so much for joining us again, for carving out another two hours or however long this is going to take to record episode number 28. Uh, we uh, left off uh, with a surprise appearance from one Milton Mendoza, who was talking about Evergrey and Galnerius and what a challenge Galnerius was to get here and how he thought, uh, how well he thought it paid off. But uh, one thing that we had... Um, that we had referred to but never actually quite got around to the other night was the culture of the festival. And, Brian, I think that you specifically had a few things to say about how the bands like to hang out or something like that. Oh, definitely. Um, It's a very weird scenario that you have such an open and welcome uh, uh, air of the festival, just the, the, the general intent of the festival is to be personal is to be uh warm and comforting and inviting uh when's the last time you've been at a uh a show for a big tour coming through to town or or at a uh a big arena show where the band genuinely wants to come out and see the other bands performing and hang out with the other fans and the other family members sometimes that are in the area well, of late, um, that usually involves paying a premium. Right, right. You would you would expect that a meet and greet would be a, a premium time, and that they they'd be uh, demanding cash tola from everybody that wants to participate in whatever they allow, whether it's signings or meet and greets, taking photos with you. And that's Whereas, on top of the cost of the tickets. Exactly, exactly. That's extra. That's always extra. It seems, and, and sometimes that's a premium ticket above the regular ticket for a festival or a concert. Whereas when you come to Atlanta for Prague power, these bands know the reputation of the festival and they know that, you know, their other bandmates have sometimes attended just as fans. And then sometimes, you know, uh, meeting the other bands that have attended the festival before them. And so they come to Prague power expecting a good time and I can tell you straight up, every band I've ever hung out with in the courtyard, in the in the uh, concourse around the arena, even on the main floor, they're there to enjoy themselves as much as the rest of the, the fans are. Uh, you can ask the guys from Manticora, uh, when they first came over to America, uh, we, inte- we attended, and it was a very special occasion with my brother uh, fighting cancer and getting done with chemotherapy, he said, I'm not going to miss seeing Manticore. I'm going to go to the festival. I, I did not know that about him, and I kind of have to give him a shout-out for that. Uh, good job, Roger, but you still have no hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and, and uh, he was, you know, he was pretty weakened by the chemotherapy kicking his ass, but he said, no, I got to go to the festival. Got to see the guys from Manticore. They promised me. Ooh. And the band themselves sent back and forth emails and, and information and then kind of hooked us up with a couple of special pieces of merchandising. Then we got to the festival. We were dead front center. We're watching the whole damn show. And then Lars decided to stage dive on us in particular, and we had to catch him. <laughs> and, and that's, that's a hell of a, of a, of a, um, camaraderie that we immediately built and then after the festival after their performance was done the festival is going on those guys are out and about this is the first time they've been to america they want to hang out with people they didn't stand behind a table and charge twenty dollars per person they were up at the bar chit-chatting posing for photos hanging out doing shots and then all of a sudden my buddy jeremy gordon says hey i'm gonna go get you guys a drink 
So was he, or I'm sorry, I, I got the drink and then Jeremy was helping me out. Uh, I, I asked the guys, what do you guys want? Uh, give me a vodka and Red Bull. So I said, okay, let me make a, a pretty stiff one. And I think I did a triple shot of vodka to a Red Bull Good and God. brought it over to the guys. And one by one, each of them were choking at how intense this drink was. Like, oh, my God, I can't do this. Here, you try it. Jeremy <laughs> comes over, takes a swig of it, goes, mm, that's not bad. All four of them <laughs> stopped in the track looking at us like, you Americans are drinking freaks. It was a, it was a proud moment. Well, those and guys are stopped. from Denmark, and like the Danes, of course, are like first cousins to the Swedes, and it's commonly known that the Swedes can't handle their freaking alcohol. And they were they were shocked that the vodka was so good in the states. So like, well, <laughs> we get it from just about anywhere else. You guys would get it. It's not like we're going to serve you bad booze. Oh. Um, I've I, I've I've got so many stories of so many meetings i've i've met the guys from pagan's mind uh i've met the guys uh eggy the bass player from ed guy i got to hang out with him and just share a couple of beers as we talked about bass gear and why he likes to play with a pick and why i like to play with fingers instead of a pick for playing bass and they just genuinely wanted to chit chat about cool stuff as opposed to being forced to stand in line being forced to take pictures in front of a backdrop they didn't care for that. They wanted to be part of the party. And then, I mean, I've shared a bottle of mead with Henning Bossi from Mayan the first time they came to town. I've, I've, I've shared different bottles of booze with Tom England from Evergrey, with um, Lance King. He's always here every year, and we're always making sure that he gets a beer from us. There's, there's so many people now that come to the festival expecting to hang out and have fun with the fans because they know it's safe. First and foremost, it's not going to be a swarm like the screaming girls of the 1960s attacking the Beatles and ripping their clothes off of them. They're just there because they genuinely care about the bands and the bands a hundred percent appreciate that vibe. Samantha, I want to get your thoughts because you're a first timer. Uh, what, uh, like uh, how, what were your observations about the, about the culture at Prague power? Well, I want to say that I pretty much came in knowing nobody. I knew someone very, very distantly from my general region and planned to meet up down there. So I was worried that I was going to spend the most of the weekend alone and, I guess, intimidated. But wherever I went, people were willing to talk to me. And over the course of the weekend, I think I probably added 100 people on Facebook. And these are people that I had such in-depth conversations with. I could probably name a few of them, where they are, what they do, right off the top of my head. It felt like, even though I had never been there, in a way it felt like I was coming home for the first time. And it was, oh gosh, it sounds so savvy, but I really felt like I had found a place where I belonged, a place where people were accepting of me and where I was respected as an individual with, you know, a lot of similar interests. It was one of the best experiences that I've ever had. I felt very welcome and very, very loved. Isn't the courtyard one of the happiest places on earth? It seriously is. I mean, where else? I had multiple people coming up to me offering me cookies, free oh, cold you, water. You met Nicole. Like, uh, <laughs> yes. Isn't she an angel? I love Nicole. She's great. Yes. Yeah, so Did you get any of the loaded gummy bears? You know, I, I, I saw... I saw them, and I heard that they live on still in between people's sticky fingers. Yes. <laughs> you know, bro, now that I think about it, that was Saturday night, and Sue shoving those things down my throat might have been why I had to be carried to my room. <laughs> exactly. She attacks people with the loaded gummy bears. Like, here, everybody, make sure you got some. She, she is the most generous soul you could ask for in a party. Uh, she's so crass, and I love her for it. Uh, Alexa, you're also a first timer. Uh, what, 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 what's your takeaway? Uh, I thought this was by far the most unique festival that I have ever been to. Um, I uh, about uh, I'm like dating myself almost, but like um, a little over ten years ago, I went to Vakin, and that was like my first big metal experience. It's um, okay. Like, Matt is still older than you are. <laughs> It's all good. Yeah. And I remember that feeling that Samantha spoke about, like coming home and feeling like, holy crap, like this is actually really normal, right? Like there's all these people and they're into the same stuff I'm into. And I think that as, you know, 
as I go through life and I'm, you know, toiling away at work and doing my thing, I think it's easy to lose sight of that. And I think, you know, like coming to, I celebrated my 30th birthday at, um, at Prague power and just like coming there It literally, I did feel like I was coming home each time because I ran into people who I grew up with like 15 years ago in the metal scene in New York who remembered me. I remembered them. Like we had drinks, we, we went out for lunch. It was really awesome. And it was just like, time had not occurred, right? Like we all just picked up right where we left off and, I met a ton of amazing people who included me um, Wait, in pretty back, much everything. Back up, back up, back up, back up. You ran into some yeah. people that you grew up with in New York. Did you know that they would be there? Um, I did through Facebook. Like, well, one person I didn't. One person I did not. And I came in. I had um, um, I had a badge for the first two days, so I came in the back door. Like, and and Galnerius was there, and, and then he was there, and I was like, "Holy crap! I'm so overwhelmed because I can, as an attendee of this festival, literally." bump into Galnerius, like walk into them and like poke myself with a guitar by mistake and then see someone who I pretty much, you know, like I, I know from like going to like Gramercy theater in New York. Um, so that was super weird, but really awesome. Yeah. And it was kind of like, like a hometown sort of thing, even though I came out from Seattle for it. Um, and to speak to, I think, was it Matt's point about like, kind of like breaking bread with the bands? Um, I just, it was like, I got to have lunch with Orden Ogan and I got to have drinks with Evergrey. And I don't think that that, like, I can't think of a single festival. Like that doesn't happen at Tuska. That doesn't happen at Maryland Death Fest. Mm -hmm. It was just really weird. Like you go into the courtyard and you're just like, wow, everybody is just so chill down to earth and just there because they're all fans and they appreciate, you know, what it means to be a part of this community, which I thought was awesome. Now, Matt, you've been going to Prague Power literally since day one, uh, and you've only missed out on one edition of the festival, and yet you're you're kind of not into the whole party scene. So I'm kind of interested in how you perceive the culture of Prague Power, you know, from your you know from your little introverted self. <laughs> yes, yes, I am an introvert. It's true. Um, and and the yeah the 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 party at the Artmore is just a little too many people for me. I'm like just trigger something in my brain, some sort of fight or flight kind of thing. And I certainly don't want to fight anybody. Um, so I just run away. Um, <laughs> but uh, as far as the culture, I think, I think it's been hit upon a few times. Like it feels very much like a family reunion by this point. And I love that even for the newbies, that's how it feels. And that's like, cause this is our tribe kind of thing. You know, these yeah. are the people live and breathe the same things you do now, that doesn't like guarantee to make them the best people in the world i mean we still have like the terror farts and stuff like that that no one ever owns up to down down at the 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 festival floor i but, swear it wasn't uh, me <laughs> but uh you know we we come from this this common background where we just have an absolute love of this music and it's not none of us are casuals you know alexa you mentioned something a moment ago that uh that kind of hit something for me you mentioned that you ran into some uh somebody that you would known in new york that you hadn't seen in many years uh that is mm -hmm. actually a pretty common occurrence and two ridiculous coincidences have uh have fallen upon me at prog power uh, in 2011 i was in the photo pit waiting for his son to come on and i strike up a casual conversation with with uh with a young lady and with a dude who they were standing right next to each other but they didn't know each other um and so the three of us just start talking and the dude whose name is frank noticed that i was wearing a san antonio spurs lanyard and he's like oh dude yeah. you're from san antonio yeah man so am i really he he, he lived, didn't live in San Antonio anymore, but like we started chatting, and he and I literally grew up three miles from one another, to the point where the school yeah. that he attended was literally attached to the church that I attended back when I was a Catholic many many years ago. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And that's it's like yeah. <laughs> and that's not even the weirdest did story. You, did you guys grow up at the same time? He's a few years younger than I am, but we did grow up in the same area, like literally just a few miles from one another. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, like like we we could walk to the same mall because that's what you did back then because we're old. And then about three years ago, I was in the courtyard 
uh, and I'm chatting it up with somebody that I'd never known before, a uh, dude from uh, Cincinnati, and and he asked me where I'm from. Well, I'm from San Antonio. Really? My wife's from San Antonio. Oh, is that so? Where did she go to high school? She went to Judson. Wait a minute. What year did she graduate from Judson? No way. Same class? No, no. Oh. She graduated a few years before I did, but, but. I we did find out very very quickly that not only did I know her in high school, I was actually crazy about her in middle school. Stop! Oh True my god! Story and and, and, ju- <laughs> and just by pure stupid happenstance, I happened to meet her husband in the courtyard at Prague Power like twenty five years later. What are the odds of that happening? I don't. I think when it comes to this That's community, crazy. though, I don't think it's like far fetched at all. Um. Because there were numerous like close encounters, or I, I don't know if that's the right term, but just like running into people, or I'm like, "Hey, where did you grow up?" And then we'll be like, "Oh, we grew up like you know somewhere like 20 miles from each other." But like that hub was like were those concert venues in New York City. That was like that that center. And then you know back in the like I, I remember before like Facebook, right? There was Last FM, and you tracked all the concerts you attended and stuff. And I remember seeing some of these people's like avatars on Last FM. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, now we're literally having, like, a pizza together in Atlanta. And we went to the (laughs) same shows, but we're never friends because, you know, I was 15 and, like, you were 17 and we just didn't talk to each other. Super weird. Yeah, and that's actually kind of how Matt and I met because, like, we were going to, the you know, to a bunch of the same shows in Texas, but we met in Chicago at Prom Mm. Power. You know, what are the odds? Yeah, there's this crazy guy in the front and I'm... Just not crazy guy in the front, but he seemed really cool. <laughs> you know, and ever since Matt and I have been hitting up shows, uh, you know, here and in Dallas. And you know what? It, it, this is a really, really great place to just meet people that you're going to be stuck with for the rest of your life. I mean, like we already talked about <laughs> the engagements that that have taken place uh, during Evergrace sets. Uh, but I have like no bullshit here. Some of the people that I've met at Park Power have become some of the people that I hold most dear. You know, and that's not an exaggeration. The people that I went with to the, or I, I flew in and I met up with some old friends who I'd known for a very long time. They had been trying to get me out for such a long time to come to this festival. And pretty much our entire friendship for some of us existed like through Facebook Messenger, like, hey, when are you going to come to Prague Power? Hey, when are you going to come to Prague Power? Hey, when are you going to do that? And then we kept staying in touch. And then I finally came to Prague Power. And I feel like we're like bonded through space and time. Like we're like, twins through so it's it's crazy but it's like all because of this festival before i even like went to it so it's nuts you know and piggybacking off of what brian had said earlier about the bands just hanging out uh i've got two names that are still legendary two prominent musicians who have spent more time hanging out in that courtyard than they than they spent hanging out backstage i'm talking about snowy shaw and of course chris perchanka from vanishing point such cool guys you know, and I want to give those guys a special shout out just for like being so willing to like, eh, I can do the backstage party stuff later. I'd rather hang out and make friends with my fans. And and those dudes are genuinely two of the most warm hearted people that I've ever met. I have to send you a picture that I took with Snowy Shaw because I caught him at the bar. I mm-hmm. told him how much I appreciated him and thanked him. And then I whipped out the phone to do the uh, selfie and you couldn't reach high enough to include him in the picture. Exactly. Um, <laughs> he's, a very, he's a very handsome, tall, debonair Swedish guy. He's um, about the size of a tree. Yeah. <laughs> you know me, Gonzo. I am uh, one of the guys that never takes a normal photo with somebody else. It's always got to be goofy. It's always got to be fun. I'm looking at your Skype avatar right now. Yeah. Why bother taking a boring photo? So I got a hold of them. We're at the bar. We take pictures together. And all of a sudden, we start giggling. And the faces we started making got worse and worse. We got more ridiculous. And I've got one impressively crazy photo with him. And he's reaching for the camera lens like like the uh, uh, the oh um, the Grapefruits of Doom. Remember? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, the back? Invisible Grapefruit. <laughs> the Invisible Grapefruits of Doom. And... <laughs> I had such a great photo with Stoey Shop, and he loved it that, you know, we're not taking a boring photo. You know, he is such an off-the-wall loving character. Like, I remember that, like, during his meet-and-greet, during his signing session, 
I, I just ran up to him and I screamed at him, dude, thank you so much for bringing the weird. And the way that his face lit up and he started cackling when he heard me say that, that became the ongoing thing. Every time he would see me for the rest of the weekend, bring the weird, bring the weird. <laughs> as, as a woman, what stood out to me was the ratio of men to women at this show. Um, and that's just something I really haven't even seen at other festivals. It was, I would say it was close to a 50-50 split men and women, definitely leaning a little more towards the men's side. But for every group of men, there was a group of women. And in a way, and as a younger woman myself, I had multiple women who had been there for um, a few years come up to me and say, you know, if you have any problems, if you, if anyone even looks at you wrong, come to us and we will make sure that you are safe. We will make sure that you have someone to talk to and that things get handled. So... Having a um, understanding, I guess, a group of protectors really was something that I wouldn't have seen anywhere else. So that was really unique to me, um, something that I had never experienced before. And it made me feel very safe and, once again, very welcome. So that was just something that I noticed that I don't think I would have experienced anywhere else. Have you ever noticed that when the mosh pits break out in the floor that you always get that perimeter patrol that's makes sure the people who don't want to get bashed up are kind of uh, blocked and made a little more secure so that, you know, Hey, you can enjoy the festival. You can enjoy the pit and make sure that you don't get all bashed up out there. And, and you'll see, you'll see some of the ladies down there, you know, especially during course at night, by the way, that's a cultural uh, event of its own. Oh yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're not ready to stomp around in the, in the pit. they you know, especially footwear these days, you know, they're, they're, they're there to enjoy themselves, not trample each other. So you see somebody that's not ready for uh, full contact combat sports on the main floor during some of, some of these bands, you'll see the other guys on the floor kind of take up that perimeter patrol and make sure, Hey, everybody's safe and secure. You're good. Okay. Now watch these guys destroy each other and everybody's cool with it. Everybody absolutely loves participating even on the perimeter of the of the mosh pit i mean that happened to me day one insomnium the pit opened and i wasn't there for the pit for insomnium i i'll have my shows where i jump in but this was not one of them and i only got hit once before some very nice large gentleman decided to put himself between me and the other large gentlemen throwing themselves into each other and it was instant it was seamless and he seemed so he seemed like it was no problem at all for him to do so just things like that i really appreciated everyone was able to like experience the show at their comfort level and be safe doing so i thought that it was i mean it wasn't my first rodeo i thought it was like pretty like i mean the pit for instance like i don't really go into the pit but i i thought that it didn't look like people were like tearing each other apart it looked pretty safe to me but in terms of the culture of the festival i did feel it was very inclusive um i do think i i mean i'm not going to say it's 50-50 split sorry if, um if that's disagreeing there i thought it was more 70% male identifying and 30% female identifying from where i was um, that being said, I didn't feel like at any point, um, I was unsafe. I didn't feel like at any point I was excluded from any experiences. Um, I was asked, um, a couple times if I liked metal, which was kind of like, okay, why are you asking me that? I'm at a festival. I didn't Oof. fly across the country, um, to stand around a bunch of middle-aged men and smell farts in the, in the crowd. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what I travel for. Why not? Um, I know, right? Like, what, am I crazy? But like, so maybe I think and that can also be like, you know, maybe some social awkwardness, perhaps. So like pro tip to the to the men or the male identifying folk out in the audience. Like, if you see a woman, like maybe ask her, how did you like the set? What was your favorite? Or what's your favorite thing so far rather than do you like metal? Because obviously, I effing like metal. Like, I'm not here in four inch heels, because I think this is fun to stand around and watch something for no reason. Right. So, um, I thought, I don't know, that's just my two cents on that, but I thought that the, the culture otherwise was very welcoming aside from that, that experience that happened a few times. And that's my experience, not dressing the standard, like metal uniform. Like I don't own band shirts. I don't buy that merch. Like that's just not how I represent myself in public. And that's totally fine to each their own. But I think that that's, I mean, my experience based on how I present myself, 
I would say that I got a little more like, do you really like being here <laughs> than like other experiences to, to be quite frank. I think a lot of the fans that come to the festival try to make sure that everyone feels welcome, especially the rookies. And sometimes you'll see people like, Hey, this is their first time. Oh dude, come on. You got to see this. You got to do that. Um, especially getting familiar where, with where everything is in the festival, like the merch room, uh, when, when, um, people are doing the gatherings at the pizzeria or in the courtyard, making sure that everybody knows all the cool stuff that's happening so they can be part of it, whether they want to or not. Alexi, you were talking about inclusivity a moment ago, and uh, and there is a small but very, very vibrant uh, crowd of LGBT people that regularly attend Prague Power. And, like, I- I'm a veteran of the Metal Fest circuit somewhat myself, and, like, that's just not something that I have seen a whole lot of. And, like, yeah. as somebody that, like, totally supports their cause, that's a really, really cool thing to see in... You know, yeah. within the you know, within a genre that has a reputation for carrying so much machismo in it, you know, I I completely agree, and um, I I mean, you don't see that in Maryland Death Fest. I'm going to be really honest; like, you don't see that inclusivity. Um, and I just, I mean, I and I'm also coming from Seattle, which is a very um, like safe space, um, very inclusive. There's a lot of protection for LGBTQ individuals in the workplace, for instance, where you might not see that in other parts of the country. So it was really nice to kind of come from this place where like, that's awesome. And then you go to Prague Power and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is like, I feel so proud to to be here. And I, I don't feel like there's this like, you know, I, I don't feel any hate. Like I didn't, maybe like people ask silly questions like, you know, like, do you like metal? But there was no hate, right? Directed towards individuals who are not um, cisgender. So that to me was just absolutely phenomenal and i felt really like that kind of warmed my little heart like i feel like there were so many heartwarming little moments from this festival and it's like we should kind of like take that to the other festivals yeah. almost you know and, and it's inclusive to the point that like one of the uh that one of the techs uh at the festival uh started transitioning genders um you know after they'd already uh they'd already been teching there at the festival and the support that they've gotten from the rest of the crew and and like i want to say the vast majority if not all of the festival attendees uh really really warmed their hearts and they went ahead and expressed that i th- i want to say that it was in the uh in the unofficial prog power facebook group uh where they were going on about how about how wonderful it is to like have that much support you know in the freaking metal community and and i chimed in and said if anybody messes with any of y'all i will be happy to intervene and yeah, what was really i saw cool, that <laughs> you know and, and what and like you know i'm not trying to like toot my own horn or anything what really made me happy was all the same 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 replies yeah. that came after i posted my comment you know that was cool you know and i and i did see that coming from a few people that i might not have otherwise expected uh to be so protective of the lgbt crowd that we have and that was really cool. It was cool. I mean, I, and again, like, I don't remember that being the case when I was like 15, 16, 17 going to shows. I honestly do not recall seeing that. And that was like any type of show ranging from like a black metal show, which I used to go to a lot of, or like death metal or even power metal. I didn't, I don't feel like I saw that, but here I just thought that it was a really progress. I mean, Prague power, right? But like, seriously, like socially progressive, accepting and that, I mean, that warmed my little heart. So I, I like that, you know, that like, I'm very proud to be part of that family for sure. You know, and, and in that thread that I just mentioned, Glenn himself um, posted that like, you know, about how protective he is of, of all the LGBT people in that crowd. So, I mean, this, this, this dude, Glenn, like genuinely loves every single person that you know that supports this festival he you know and uh and i guess we love him for it too don't we <laughs> uh i just wanted to quickly mention the the two theme nights that have happened um the the first one that's going for many years is the ladies doing corset night because they use this as an excuse to get all dialed up and get all of their cool stuff out of the closet and come down there and, and really ham it up and have a blast. My roommate started that. (laughs) (laughs) And then the, the 
Hawaiian shirt night that kind of was a joke about Glenn and how he always wears a very easily identifiable shirt in the crowd so that anybody in the festival that needs to get a hold of him very quickly can find him immediately. And then somebody online said, dude, everybody, let's go and get Hawaiian shirts for for one of the years. And what I, I don't know what, 75 people all dressed up just like Glenn, and they had a picture with uh, all of them together. That's not something that people do at music festivals at all. You would never hear of that at a regular touring show. You'd never see that at Ozfest or Mayhem Fest or Maryland Death Fest or anything like that. You would you would never hear of that. But for whatever reason, the people at Prog Power want to have fun outside of just attending a concert or just attending a festival. And they find these cute, really personal little ways of bonding. I guess that's the best way, word to use it. There's all these things that people do is for bonding with all the other cool people that they've known for so many years. It's something you just don't see at any other kind of show. You know what else you don't see at any other kind of show? Rubber ducks. <laughs> that is the greatest thing ever. Oh my crap. The fountain was awesome this year. Um, if anybody's uh, not aware, the Artmore Hotel has a courtyard and in the middle of it is a big old water feature a fountain and somebody years ago My brought roommate. a little rubber ducky and let it she did that too <laughs> let that little rubber ducky float around in the fountain and we're like oh that's so cute the next year there's like 20 ducks in there the year after that there's got to be 75 to 100 ducks and they're all different little rubber duckies and i saw duckies painted up like the members of Kiss. I saw the uh, 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 the rock and roll duckies with the guitar, and I, I can't believe that these rubber duckies even existed. Yet somebody out there is like, "Hey, I'm going to bring them to the festival. I'm going to bring them to Prague Power." And there was and one year where we were still, like actually like writing names on the bottoms of the ducks. Like there was Quacksrike and Nick Van Duck and other such things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and mind you, this started happening before the famous Ale Storm concert last year. Oh, this is five or six years running now, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's been going on a few years now. And that that unbelievable show last year, and the one photo that that took mm. the festival by storm after it. Mm, the Mike Edwards photo, yep. Duck, yep. That duck flying through the air oh and in the cloud and the haze of the stage lights. That's the greatest thing I've ever seen ever, forever and ever. <laughs> and they made t-shirts of it. That was amazing. I want one of those t-shirts. I, uh, I'll pay fat cash. If any of you guys listening know how to get me that shirt, I will pay fat money to get me one of those shirts. That was brilliant. And and Alexa, I actually saw a photo of you partaking in one of our legendary Prog Power customs, Nanners. Oh, boy. Tell us about Um, Nanners. Oh, my gosh. Well, that, so I have been working through what my dear friend Amanda and longtime Prague Power vet, uh, who, by the way, I had only met once at my friend Greg's wedding. Greg is another Prague Power attendee. We stayed in touch basically because of Prague Power and me hopefully attending one day. So either way, through this group of people, they were like, you got this bingo card of experiences. You have to somehow check off when you're at Prague power because why not? Right. Mm -hmm. And so apparently if someone, and this is, and I consider myself like very professional and fit. Right. And so this is not something I would normally do. Um, apparently if someone passes out of drunkenness in public, um, one, if they chance, if one chances upon this, this poor soul, one should drop bananas by them Mm -hmm. and then take a photo and obscure their face. Right. Um, and so, I was walking with one of my dear friends who I was at Prague power with. And he was like, Oh my God, you have to run, like get the bananas. And so I'm like running down the hall of the art more and he's running down the hall of the art more and we got it. And then it was just really weird. Cause I'm like, is that on the bingo card? Yep. That's on the bingo card check. So <laughs> that was checked off the bingo card and it just, I don't know. <laughs> it gets so weird. <laughs> like who am I? So it developed of people just passing out so it's just a drinking joke then that's how it well, started it's, that's how it was described to me right there's this thing right where if someone and i don't know how it started so if you know perhaps you know like in a later 
next Prague Power, you can get a Prague Power historian on there. I'm just a PhD dropout. I don't have my <laughs> my history PhD uh. true story, so I can't t- tell the tale um, in its entirety. Um, but I have no idea how it started. So essentially, if someone drank too much and is acting like really, you know, just like passes out in public, you would drop bananas on them. And then it's a nanners. And so I got one and I was like, what is wrong with me? Like, I'm 30 years old. What am I doing running around a hotel? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so <laughs> hilarious because all my friends were just like, yep, it's prog power. And I'm like, I kind of wish this was like how college was when, when I went, <laughs> like Ooh, it would have right. been so, it was like a vacation to the past essentially. And it was kind of, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> like I had to go Package to work up, on Monday up, and I was up. like, how can I go to work on Monday when all this has transpired the week before? <laughs> like no one knows, no one understands me. So yeah. So y'all are not going to believe who started Nanners. Thank you for the, his- the history tidbit now. <laughs> you asked me who started Nanners. Who started it? Tell us. My roommate, Cassandra Metal Rose. Metal Rose, you are such a villain. You you are the evilest person at this festival year in and year out. It's so <laughs> awesome. Uh, shout out. Oh, Metal Rose, you are ridiculously awesome. Thank this you. Is, this is one of the reasons I hold her so close to my heart. I love her so much. She's amazing. She has Free. an amazing, wicked, wicked mind. Oh, yeah. She's terrible. I love it. <laughs> the sharpest tongue and the best sense of humor. Everything is funny to her. She cannot see bad in anything. She only sees the best jokes and the best opportunities every year, every time I see her. But even that, I mean... I understand how that can be evil, right? I'm going to preface this by saying I get the evil aspect to it. But if this was another festival, I honestly feel like it would have been like, did you get a picture of this guy? Let's just like send it out to people and not obscure his face or something like that. I feel like it actually was like evil, but like in a respectful way, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Were you just picking on the guy? And actually, the best nanners that I've ever seen. Like, I want to say that I was with her. We were hanging out in the lobby, and it was late one night. And there's a guy passed out uh, on one of the seats at the Artmore lobby, and and it's some ungodly hour of the morning, and there's a whole bunch of chaos, you know, swarming all over the place. And this guy, he's passed out. He's got a banana on his head, and and he shifts a little bit while he sleeps. The banana falls into his lap. He wakes up, (laughs) picks up the banana, puts it back on his head, and goes back to sleep. (laughs) What planet are we on? (laughs) Planet's Prague Power. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Oh, God. Well, shall we go ahead and get started with the music? Yeah, that old thing. All right. Let's see. We are up to day three. It is Friday. It is September, what, 6th, I think? I don't even remember anymore. And the first band that was up was a band called Paladin. Um, What do y'all know about these guys? Samantha, let's start with you. So I will admit, I knew nothing about them until they were posted as a replacement, at which point I immediately went to Spotify and was like, all right, what am I getting myself into? And I was blown away for a band that didn't have much music out, how mature their music sounded, how well they had already settled into a style how well they were able to showcase their talents against one another. And I saw that live, too. For a group of very young musicians, compared to a lot of bands in the scene, they played with absolute professionalism. The voice that came out of their vocalist, it seemed that it it couldn't have come from his tiny body. It filled the room. And the absolute range that he was able to hit was incredible i was blown away by their performance the high energy it was relentless probably for me it was one of the most enjoyable um sets of the entire entire festival what i was personally looking forward to the most was seeing their synergy live because the mis- the mix of their album was very very well balanced And sometimes a band has that cohesion and that mutual understanding to make that dynamic work on stage. Whereas other times, the brilliant guitarist or the overzealous drummer will try to outcompete each other. But that wasn't the case. They all shared the stage very well. And that very dynamic sound where each instrument really got to shine played out entirely on stage. Additionally, they... 
this isn't a negative, but they didn't seem to take themselves too seriously. They really did seem like it was the joy of the music. Oh, no, that's a great thing. Carrying them. And they were even... So they actually ended up filming with a professional film crew and a big crane over the stage for the entire set. Because they they said, you know, this is our big opportunity up on the big stage. We never thought this would happen. We got a film crew to come in and, like, capture this. And they were so spirited, and everyone was such a good sport. And for an opening set, that pit area was jam-packed. I personally... The energy that they started off day three with was so vibrant and so exciting. And being able to see them live and actually hang out with them afterwards, they hung out all day, I think really made their set something very special. And I am glad that even though they had to get shoehorned in as a result of some um, unfortunate unfortunate mishaps with the roster, um, I think that they were a very, very good replacement and deserved their spot up on that stage did you wield an inflatable sword during that set no i almost fought someone for one but i'm like it's not that deep next time you fight that person no 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 that that's worth bloodshed (laughs) it was the first set i had i had to save my blood okay okay fine it was the first set of that day oh man no but it was a good one i enjoyed it immensely cool so after Paladin, we had Subsignal. Uh, Alexa, what did you think of those guys? Um, I thought they were really confusing. Um, so prior to Prog Power, um, I kind of went through the discography of each band, even the ones whose visas did not go through. So I listened to a lot of music before the festival. Um, and I struggled to get into their music. And I'm sorry if I hurt any butts um, for people who are listening. That was the most confusing set. Um of the entire festival um, that I watch. If this was a Tinder profile, I would swipe left because every photo on this guy's profile would have looked like a different person. Hmm. I thought that it, it was just super weird. Like there was, it wasn't a, a cohesive set. Like the so one song like had a, like a super, like, like it, it evoked like three eleven to me. And then other, like other ones just kind of like blended into nothingness I was sitting with a row of of seasoned prog power vets and we're all just sitting there like, what are we listening to? This is really kind of strange. Um, And so I, nothing about that set made me want to learn more about them. And unfortunately, like if they have really awesome stuff, like I would, you know, send it to me, I would love to hear it, but I just did not have any curiosity peaked from that. And it just seemed very out of place. I remember liking what I heard, but I couldn't describe it to you today. I mean, you're allowed to like, we're all allowed to like or not like what we heard. I just thought it was weird. Like, and and I like weird stuff, but it was just kind of like, I didn't know what the logic was in putting the songs together the way it was. And I'm curious, like when they tour, like what their set list is like when they tour, Um, just because it didn't make sense to me. Now, there have been a number of like completely left, uh, left field bands that have played there over the years that have gotten exact opposite responses from what you're describing like i remember when diablo swing orchestra played they play like a weird brand of like swing death metal dance music and it's awesome and even though nobody in the crowd had really paid much attention to them before that entire place was bouncing some of us were very excited about that show oh yeah i was looking forward to that too that was so much fun but, like, I'm guessing that that's not really what you saw during Subsignal, that you didn't see that kind of reaction for them. Yeah, it just, it seemed, I don't know, I just, I wasn't feeling it. I'm sure some people were. I'm sorry if anyone is butt hurt. not sorry, but I just, it wasn't, it, I don't know. It was just very confusing to me, and it wasn't entertaining, so, oops. I totally love Subsignal because of the, uh, mu- the musical aspect of it, the, the musicianship and song crafting really got to me like i started paying attention to how intricate the songs were even though this isn't the kind of music that i'm going to listen to when i'm late for work and i need to get there and i need to haul out you know that's what pantera is for it's not the kind of music where i want to pick up my instrument and start learning the riffs from you know that's that's more like what you know, haken or you know evergrey is is for this this band was a very groovy ambience to their music that I I loved and I bought two albums 
and I can I can easily foresee this being my background music when I'm in the wood shop, when I'm working in the garage, when I'm doing stuff. I want to have that music playing to fill up the 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 room and just just absorb the music as opposed to sit there and study it, nitpick it, learn it, mm. or, or 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 get too intricate with the music. I I think that music is going to be so very soothing for me on a musical level. Well, send me the album. <laughs> send me the album that you recommend because I didn't get that vibe at all from the show, but I'm open-minded. <laughs> they had a uh, uh, kind of like a greatest hits disc. It was a two disc compilation of their first 10 years. And I got the recent one, La Muerta, which was okay. their, the, the, the album that they're touring with. And I specifically remembered the name of one of the songs i checked that compilation disc and it's on there so i know i'm going to be happy with one of those um but it's it's they're the they're the musicians band not the uh music fans band if that makes any sense this is the kind of music that a musician is going to appreciate more than just a a general music fan is going to appreciate and that's kind of alienating and kind of specializing it's it's kind of like a um how some people don't get haken yet every show that i've gone to since they debuted at prog power every time they've had a huge full room up in detroit or down here in atlanta that everybody knows their stuff however it's still a niche market. It's still a very eclectic group of people that are going to like that music, but boy, do they like it. Um, on what Brian was saying about them being a musician's band, I think that makes sense because they, a lot of those guys were in a very technical band called Sieges Even for a while. Yes. And and I really did like guys Sieges from Dreamscape. Well, uh, sorry, did you say something about Dreamscape? Yeah, half the members are from Sieges even, and I think the rhythm section of the keyboards are from Dreamscape, right? So these guys are not exactly slouches. I mean, like, Sieges even, like, I remember that people used to talk smack about them and call them a poor man's watchtower, but they were actually very, very, very good. So, but, like, you know, but what we saw when Subsignal was playing is something very, very different from what we've heard from them before. I mean, like, Sieges even doing, like, the weird tech metal and Dreamscape doing the classic prog metal sound. That's not what Subsignal is about. Yeah, I love them. (laughs) Yeah, I don't. (laughs) So, about a year and a half ago, while Nightwish was touring for their decades uh, greatest hits thing, and they were doing an incredible set uh during that tour um i drove up to dallas to shoot that show and uh and i stayed with an old friend of mine his name's matt he happens to be on the line (laughs) and um and he let me hear a band that he'd been digging that reminded him that he said reminded him of the opeth of yore and a few months later that band was announced for prog power 20 i'm talking about barren earth matt what you got about them the funny thing with Baron Earth, I got I got to Prog Power a little late, so I caught uh, Baron Earth as the first band. I really didn't want to miss them, and I got there, and uh, someone was complaining about a lot of bands having piped in vocals. I know that you guys have talked about that before on Talking Perspectives, um, and uh, Baron Earth started playing, and I pretty quickly noticed there wasn't anything that was piped in at all. The guys up there that were playing, that was all them and nothing else. There was no tape or anything like that. Um, and I noticed pretty quickly early on that uh, Ollie, their uh, bass player, the bass player, player for Amorphous uh, now as well, and oh, back in the day, yeah. was not there. Um, and uh, turns out they had two fill-ins on stage with them. Um, but it didn't really seem to matter all that much. They played a pretty ambitious set um with like on lonely towers which is the long long song from uh the first album that john sings on uh they had a really really great energy on stage um and john sounded fantastic i felt like the the mix with his voice was a little bit on the low side but uh otherwise the sound was really good and the guitar playing was phenomenal 
Now, uh, you mentioned that uh, that Oli Pekalainen was not there on base. I forget the gentleman's name, but it turns out that the guy who was playing bass for Baron Earth that night had also been an amorphous. And it wasn't Nicholas. <laughs> it, w- it was another guy, but like they've had several d- different bass players. But yeah, so th- those bands are pretty tightly knit. I love that set. I thought it was just what I needed after Subsignal. It was a great palate cleanser. Um, I saw them back in 2011. Um, I think they were on tour with like NC Ferrum or something. And I'm pretty sure that's why I bought a ticket for that show <laughs> because I don't care for those other bands. And so it was neat to see them years later. And I thought it was fantastic. I, I enjoyed that, like sitting down, just watch That wasn't something where I felt the need to like stand up close for, but I thought it was just kind of like dreamy. Like, um, the vocals I thought were fantastic. Um, and so I, I loved it. I was pretty happy with the with the show, and obviously it was a little bit different than when I saw them years prior. But I mean, this for me that's a band where like I could put that on in the background and like enjoy a really nice Pinot Noir and listen to them. <laughs> and I just like I would, and I just love that. And that's I mean, I thought it was great. It was a it was a nice. Um, there was the vocals also. There was more like like a, you said like a call out to like earlier Opeth with just like there was a nice mix of, of death vocals, clean vocals. It was great. It was, I think a nice change, um, in the, uh, in the, in the lineup for the, the festival. I'm pretty sure that's the first time Baron earth has ever been compared to a sorbet. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Up after Baron earth was the band that convinced me to go to Prague power 20 in the first place. I'm going to let Matt start off on this psychotic waltz. Oh my God. Uh, Glenn frequently, especially for us older people, eh, even, even maybe for the younger people, he pulls these, these bands out of, out of legend or ether where, you know, it's like, Oh, I'll, I'll never see this band live. Uh, I just, I'll just listen to the CDs and, and imagine what it would be like. And he, he pulls these sets out like, like he did with fate's warning with John Arch where it's just like, oh my God, I can't believe that I'm going to see this. Oh my God, I'm seeing this right now. And for me, the Psychotic Waltz albums, like back in the late 90s, early 2000s, were like kind of like really, really, really hit me really deeply, especially the first two albums. Um, I, I just really resonated with them. And to see them done live was just, really really very emotionally affecting for me and I actually i did i did break down crying uh when they played into the upper flow and then again when they played i believe mm-hmm. uh, I, I remember i remember Sorry. yeah yeah now you know it's i i actually got turned on to psychotic waltz i'd known about them since the late 90s like right after they broke up but i'd never heard them <laughs> until i want to say it was 2004 my ex and i had just gotten back from Prague power and and like we do the first thing that we did when we got back to san antonio was go to half price books and i happened upon a couple of cds by psychotic waltz uh and a social grace was one of them Uh, i snatched them immediately having never heard them before and a social grace hit me from the very beginning and i ended up really really bonding with that album it holds something really really special to me and and i think the coolest thing about about uh about seeing those guys live finally after all these years and 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 mind you they've been on my bucket list even though like i knew that i'd probably never see them thanks for proving me uh wrong again glenn thank you um what what really surprised me besides like the energy that they had on stage besides remaining so calm they were still kind of bursting with energy somehow um was watching uh brian and dan the guitar players during those really weird harmony lines towards the end of and the devil cried um i didn't realize that they were doing tapped harmonics on those and what was really cool about that was how aggressively they were doing it i mean like they're basically beating their guitars uh their, their fretboards with their middle fingers to get those tapped harmonics and doing those really really weird uneasy bends to go with them and they were doing this in harmony and and like you know when you've been going to something like park power for so many years you think you've seen it all but you haven't you know yeah. and 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 it's you know in tap harmonics i mean that's one of the first techniques that you learn after you break out of the blues box when you're learning guitar um but to see it done that aggressively 
and yet that uh, soothingly was something of an eye opener. Like you can really do really really weird things on that instrument, and people tend to lose sight of that because like they're going off into like you know uh, they're going off into like eight string and funky fret. I, I don't know what that what that fret style is called, but when they web out in order to get a better pitch, like yeah, all that stuff's awesome. But you can just take a That's six the string fan fret design. And uh, so their front man, Devin Graves, formerly known as Buddy Lackey, what a performer. What would you think of him? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had known from watching some of the live videos that he might have a hard time with some of the old, older songs and the really, really high-pitched notes, and he did. But that didn't ever seem to stop him. That didn't ever seem to throw him off. And... When he was in his comfort zone, he was absolutely compelling and a really, really phenomenal performer. Very mesmerizing, like sometimes really, really powerful, but then kind of hypnotic. Uh, uh, People might maybe compare him to Maynard from Tool, um, but he faced the audience. (laughs) (laughs) And you could actually see him. There was that, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I felt like at least for for me as a longtime fan, I felt like he was a really good frontman and had a really good command over the audience. The way that he was writhing, I mean, like you would have thought that he was possessed. Uh, I did joke with my buddies later on that he had inadvertently announced next year's lineup through interpretive dance. Yes, indeed. Th- that was y'all's cue to laugh. Y'all didn't laugh. I'm disappointed now. <laughs> You already told the joke. We We can unmute and laugh. Okay, unmute and laugh. All right. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Thank y'all so much for stoking my bat. LOL. LOL. Okay, you can shut up now. (laughs) But yeah, Matt, I am totally with you, man. Like, I I shed my first tears uh, of Prog Power 20 during I Remember. Uh, That song just, I mean, it's got that toll vibe about it, but it's heavy. You know, it's got those like wistful, reminiscent lyrics, and it's just such a gorgeous song. And like to finally hear it live it did something for me. It's not often that you see flutes in metal. That's true. He's he's got that uh, that Ian Anderson lineage that uh, a few other bands have, but he took it a little further than most by by playing the flute. He plays it very, very, very much in that Jethro Tull style. Cool. So uh, they also opened their set with something that we'd never heard before because it's not out yet. Right. Yeah. They're they they've been working on a new album for they said six years, and uh, that was one of the songs from the new album, and uh, it sounded really good to me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Like I remember the the two of us were chatting with uh, with Mr. Graves uh, out in the lobby. And he was talking about how they'd been sending, because he lives in Europe now, so they've been sending the stuff back and forth to one another, and it's being mixed by a certain Jens Bogren, who's done like Opeth and who knows who else. Everything that man does sounds incredible. And and um, and not, not a lot of people know this, but their last album, Bleeding, which came out in 1995, was the very first uh, uh, album cover that was ever done by a certain guy named Travis Smith, whom yep. I'm sure everybody's familiar with. I mean, he's done Opeth and Catatonia. I think he did Tori Amos. You know, uh, he, he's got he's got a really, really, really thick portfolio. And uh, and uh, Devin Graves did confirm with me that he is being brought back to do the new Psychotic Waltz album, which I think is only appropriate. They kickstarted his career, and. And, you know, that guy has an incredible eye. He's got a lot of skill. I mean, like, I love his vision. You know, I, I think I first became aware of it when I became a Nevermore fan in the late 90s. And, um, and, and like, especially, like, in Catatonia's Tonight's Decision, there is one photograph. I know that I'm going off on a tangent here that doesn't, you know, directly involve Psychotic Waltz. But at the same time, you know, uh, Travis Smith is part of the Psychotic Waltz legacy. But, like, this one photo in this Catatonia album um, uh, is simply of a chair, and there's somebody, and there's a pair of suspended feet over it, and off in the wall in the background, you can see the shadow of a, of a person hanging from a noose. It is creepy as yeah. f***, and I love it. Yeah, that's very appropriate for Catatonia. Spot yeah. on. Yes, their lead singer, uh, 
absolutely has the charisma that you need to be in front of an audience. That guy knows how to work a crowd. He was mm-hmm. very much a focal point of that band. But I didn't realize that Psychotic Waltz had such a long history and that there was such a gap between their last material and their current activity. I didn't realize that they'd been around that long. Dude, that's why I screamed like a little girl when they were announced last year. You know, this is something that was never supposed to happen, and here it is happening. Yeah, they formed up in like 1985. Did did this reunion happen because Glenn asked for it, or was Psychotic Waltz just happened to be rejuvenating themselves, and Glenn caught wind of it and said, well, damn it, get on my festival. Um, I want to know the the timeline. They they were formed a few years ago to do a short tour of Europe with Symphony X, um, but but I don't think that they've done anything else since then. Uh, I certainly wasn't aware of anything. Yeah, they they did the, for their first re- reunion to uh, show I think back in like 2010. It's been almost 10 years, wow. and uh, they have done occasional festivals since then. And they did that tour with Symphony X. Um, and uh, Devin's done a few things on the side with like Arion, uh, Human Equation, and Theater Equation. Um, and did uh, did a really great album called, called The Shadow Theory. Uh, it's kind of almost King Diamond esque. Uh, but but really, yeah, the band has had no real unique musical out- output since the mid '90s, and to have something coming out soon is very exciting. Okay, let's go on and uh, move to the fifth band of day three. Um... They're called Orden Organ. I like to call them Organ Donor, and uh, I think Alexa's got a few things to say about them. What you got? So I call them Double O because I I can't bother myself with pronouncing this correctly. So I call them Double O. Um, this is a band where I had seen I think like a couple YouTube videos of them of like either like at Summer Breeze or Vakin, um, maybe like a year ago. And so when I got my ticket to Prague power, I was like, Oh, these guys, the name I can't pronounce. This is going to be interesting. Maybe I'll invest some time in listening to them. So I listened to them and I'm like, wow, I actually really like this, which is not like, this is not a band I would normally like to be quite honest. They effing nailed it. I thought this was for me, the top set of the festival. I thought it was by far like the most, if you want to talk about like metal moment of the festival, um, I guess like three days prior to Prague Power, um, the bass player or one of the guitar players had a family emergency. So the lighting guy, the lighting tech jumped in and became a bass player for their performance at the festival and did not look oh. out of place at all. Hmm. Like he looked like he was a member of the band. And so I was shocked. He might as well join the band at that point. He was so oh perfect God. on that. He was. He looked like he be- he was born to do that. But just imagine, like three days prior, you think you're coming to Prague Power to be the lighting tech. You're on stage. My mind was blown. And so you could just. I was. I couldn't help but smile because not only were they playing songs that I really wanted to hear a great sampling of their discography from Vale to Gunmen, but he's up there like it's Christmas and he, he had so much joy in his face and I'm just like smiling, thinking about it right now. And it, I mean, it was, it was just fantastic. And I got to, um, I got to have lunch with them the next day, which again is like a weird prog power thing where you can just like have lunch with the band. And he was saying how he was studying like hardcore studying for like three days just to be able to pull this off. And I thought it sounded like, like normal, like it sounded completely normal. And obviously he knows, like he knows the songs, he knows the scent, like the cues and everything, but like what? (laughs) Um, And it was just like, it, to me, it felt like a party and I got kind of emotional during it just because certain songs reminded me of like, of a friend who was really into metal who passed away a couple of years ago. And I was thinking, wow, he really would have liked this live show. And so it was just a really dreamy kind of like set I wasn't expecting to get, but I loved every minute of it. So I was blown away. I thought it it was awesome. So my my two cents on that. Yeah, I I love that character of theirs. The uh, what's Alistair Vale? Uh, I saw the guy in cosplay dressed up like him uh, yeah. running through the crowd, and. I want I want that as my Halloween costume this year. I just want to walk around with uh I want I want to get one of those old style, you know, 1800s pistols and 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 
like sneak a, a vape pen inside it so it's always smoking <laughs> and, and just walk around the street with my face blackened out my eyes looking all creepy and just walk up to people that that's that should be the next horror movie character it's so unique it's so clever and i'm watching the entire stage production and how they had their 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 backdrop wall wrapping around the whole stage and and it's not that difficult to get something like that printed up, but it took somebody being very, very clever in their graphic art and design to make something that is going to look so perfect. It, it, it isn't something complex, but it definitely looked perfect for making that stage look like it was all theirs. You know, it, it, like, like you would expect from a big production from Trans-Siberian Orchestra you know, going out there with stage props and stuff, that whole stage, even though it's, you know, only a 30 minute set change, looked like it was his whole stage. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to day three's headliner, a little Swedish outfit called seventh wonder. Samantha, we haven't heard from you in a bit. Are you a seventh wonder fan? I am. I have been for a good few years now. Um, and I was really, really looking forward to their performance. Now, I figure I'll let other people speak to their musicianship in, um, I guess, the pure musical sense. But what really impressed me about their set was that their last, well, all of their albums are conceptual albums. And some bands struggle to pull off conceptual albums live, especially if they're only picking and choosing parts of the overall narrative to play. But Seventh Wonder managed to procure a set list that made their conceptual songs accessible and inclusive without making it seem disjointed, especially for albums like Mercy Falls that run seamlessly from song to song. They were still able to pull songs out of that overall album to play successfully live and engage audience members who might not be so familiar with their discography. So I personally thought that alone, just crafting that set list, old material, new material, different conceptual narrative pieces was art in itself. I agree with that point very much. Um, I thought it was pretty amazing uh, that they played uh, the, at least parts of The Great Escape and really like made it work. Um, there, there are parts of that song where um, Tommy's just basically like continuously singing like counterpoint with themselves. It's very clearly, you know, something you can do in the studio. And so they had to pipe in vocals for that. It was not, it would be impossible otherwise, but the way it was done was utterly seamless. And the whole show, my, my big takeaway from the whole show was how like I did not detect one single mistake from any of the people up there. It was utterly perfect and like studio, like, level perfection like one take from everybody through the whole thing utterly perfect i mean i mean probably you know in in their actual experience it wasn't that way but to me as an audience member it was a seamless perfect production and especially compared to their 2014 performance um which uh andreas in the uh program admits like they had not gotten together for a while they hadn't done a lot of rehearsing like this one, they were ready and they just were phenomenal. Now, in 2014, was that when they did all of Mercy Falls? Yes. Huh. And they ended up putting that out on DVD, but you're telling me that it wasn't exactly a great performance from them? I I felt that, especially on I, Tommy, is a phenomenal singer. He's like yes, one of one of the once in a generation type singers. In my opinion, he's like up there with like Freddie Mercury. Yes. So I hold him in the highest esteem, but either it was not a good time for him in 2014 or it just things weren't working for the band, like, like preparation wise, just there were times, especially, especially the Saturday show that they played, they just didn't sound perfect. And mm. Tommy, Tommy was a little bit off and I don't know. What was up with that? Uh, all due respect to those guys. They're phenomenal musicians, every one of them. 
but it just was a little bit off. And I had seen, you know, this is this is their third time playing Prog Power. I'd seen them that first time and been blown away by this new band, by this band that I'd never seen live. And then the 2014 show, I had very high expectations and I don't really feel like they were met. I give mm. props to them for putting that DVD out anyway. And from what I understand, I, I haven't seen it. From what I understand, like all the the little blemishes are on display. They didn't studio wash them away. That's brave. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a document of a very ambitious uh, set list uh, to, to play a whole album is uh, usually there are songs on a modern prog metal album that don't are not conducive to being played live, but they played everything um, in 2014. This time they were able to pick and choose across their, their catalog uh, like Samantha said, and they were able to just like pick absolute highlights and, and crowd favorites from like, all of their their albums that Tommy's on and yeah it was just it was phenomenal so like I'm kind of a casual fan of Seventh Wonder I mean like I've heard, listened to some of their albums here and there and they're good uh, but none of them really do a whole lot for me except for Mercy Falls I mean like I could do without the voice acting on that album but apart from that it is an unbelievable piece of work and um and so I also had high expectations coming from their performance because the level of musicianship and the level of, you know, the amount of thought that would have to go into composing stuff like what's on Mercy Falls is just incredible. I mean, like, I can't fathom having to compose something like that and then making it sound so so seamless and off the cuff. I think that's what really... that I think that's really what... Uh, you know what makes that album shine so much is that it sounds so spontaneous but but by its very complexity you know that it's meticulously composed um yeah. you know and to be able to perform that you know sounding like it's just happening in a jam room is that that's not that that speaks volumes about not only their technical proficiency but also their cohesion as a as a unit so yeah so I, I was I was prepared to walk in and be blown away, and and I kind of wasn't, and because it seemed like everything was done very by the book, which when your music is that complex, yeah, that's perfectly fine. I get it. Um, I just didn't really get. It didn't really feel to me like their performance was particularly inspired. Um, I didn't see a whole lot of action. Now, now watching Andreas on the bass, that was a treat. That dude smokes. Um, but yeah. the, re the rest of the guys, they just didn't seem like they didn't seem like they were there. They were too busy concentrating on the performance, you know, which of course is what you want. But they didn't seem like they were giving a whole lot of attention to the audience in front of them, you know. Which well, I see exactly what you're saying. And unfortunately, when it comes to bands with frontmen as dynamic as Tommy is, it gets to a point where no matter how complex the music is, in a live setting, a lot of the musicians become props. And I really do think that's unfortunate because especially that bass has so much to deliver, especially with Seventh Wonder. But the way that Tommy was just dominating the stage jumping up on those platforms that were set up specifically for him to jump on. Um, it, it was all eyes on him. He's see, the focal point. He's the eye candy. And it does <laughs> draw away from the music. See, now, now I fully admit that I did not catch the entirety of their set. Like, I guess I just walked in. I, I, I think it was towards the end of their set, and they must have just been tired or something. But, like, I did not see Tommy jumping up on any platforms. You know, I didn't see him engaging with the crowd. I didn't see anything that I would want to see, uh, you know, from that. And that's not a dig at him as a singer, because, because the dude is, like Matt said, one of the all-time greats. You know, and and I, I was just hoping that I would see something a little more, I don't want to say inspiring, because he nailed everything, everything that he was trying to hit. And the lines that he writes are not exactly simple. Um, 
but like I just didn't really feel a whole lot of engagement with the crowd. But like I said, I probably just walked in at the wrong time. Cool. So that's a wrap for day three of Prague Power number 20. Uh, let's see. The final day of Prague Power 20 was uh, Saturday. What date was it? I'm, it's already slipped my mind. Seven, it was the seventh. S- thank you. September 7th, uh, 2019. Uh, the first band up was an outfit called Sorcerer, about I about whom I knew precious little. Uh, Samantha, what, what do you know about them? So I didn't know much about Sorcerer coming into Prague Power, but I would say they were probably one of the biggest wild cards of the of the of the festival because they were they brought doom to the stage doom metal as and that was a lot stronger than their prog influences where even with insomnium you got that overall melodic progressive guiding hand across their death metal sorcerer brought very very strong doom presence to the stage and it was dynamic it was explosive and exciting and they seem to have a very eclectic mix of um sounds that they were able to they performed very well their technical performance was great their stage presence was astounding and for doom metal which can sometimes be a bit difficult to excite an audience with especially an audience that might not be as familiar with it they did a fantastic job of opening day four to a handful of very enthusiastic audience members who they actually ended up bringing up on stage with them. Oh, cool. Yeah. They, in, they invited two of their audience members who had been singing along the entire time up on stage with them to wave their big prop flags and even sing into one the, of the Those guys were, were sponsors. Yeah, that's I think they were. Probably. That's what it looked. I'm pretty sure. At least one of them. They I were the sponsor. band sponsors. Yeah. So it seemed like everyone had the time of their life there at that last song. And I was personally pleasantly surprised by the energy that they were able to bring. And the, you know, it was fresh. It was exciting. It was new. I loved it. Matt, what'd you think of Sorcerer? I, I concur with Samantha. That was a, a sound and a style that since really there that wasn't represented really much in the festival they and they did so really 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 well they they're a band where you know the guys the guys have a lot of musical history behind them but uh you know in in separate bands um but uh now that they're back together and they've had two very strong very popular albums come out um they were they were just really really smooth practiced on stage um Andy Andy has a phenomenal stage presence, very commanding. Um, and yeah, they're not slow, slow funereal type stuff. This is, you know, very much in the Black Sabbath candle mass vein of doom. I uh, can actually get fairly, fairly good paced. And uh, they were a very energetic opener, actually, for a doom metal band. Um, really, really polished sound. Now, I understand that Sorcerer has something of an interesting backstory. I can draw an outline of it. I don't know all the details, but I do know that they they had like a demo uh, back in maybe like the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and uh, it kind of became legendary in the doom metal scene. Um, but then they they things didn't really work out for them. They broke up. Uh, Andy uh Engberg, the singer uh went on and i think he was in a band called lion's share um it was kind of a melodic metal band mm-hmm. um and i uh, did that for years and years um and but but sorcerer was always kind of like this cult cult uh doom metal band and when they decided to get back together it was many many years later um but uh yeah that that reunion album is uh, pretty strong and uh I had not actually heard anything about the band before they were announced for Prog Power, but I checked them out, listened to both of the albums on that magical thing called YouTube, and I really liked what I heard. And uh, they pulled it off live, and they were, yeah, really fantastic opener. I think the Candle Mass reference is, is pretty damn accurate. 
I've never seen such an intricate doom metal band. Their their tone, the the their their moments of their guitar harmonies were really um not doomy. <laughs> it hmm. was so much better than just calling it doom metal. It was it, it, it eye opening for me. Yeah, so I'm a sorcerer because I was preparing for my interview with Hanzi of Demons and Wizards, and that was scheduled for 4 o'clock. Also scheduled for 4 o'clock was a performance by Jack Panzer, who I really wanted to see because I haven't seen them since, like, 2002 or something like that. Uh, Matt, you caught them. Yeah, yeah, they they played the first Prog Power back in February of 2001. Um, And uh, it was kind of a weird, sort of surreal, closing the circle kind of thing to see them at prog power again after such a long time. Um, I am, I'm kind of a casual fan. Uh, I got into them with, around like the fourth legacy and uh, age of mastery and Thane to the throne. The fourth um, judgment, like the fourth legacy is a Camelot album. <laughs> thank you. Thank You're you. Like I said, casual, <laughs> casual. I was about um, to mention how many, how many fourth legacies are out there? <laughs> yeah. Do go on. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I, uh, I like it when they get a little more complicated, a little more ambitious because I'm a prog guy. Um, and uh, I always thought that Mark Briotti, the guitarist, uh, was a really positive presence in the metal scene. But they went silent for a long, long time. And uh, I don't have the new album, but uh, it seems like uh, they're surprisingly going really, really strong. Uh, I thought that their show was really really solid i thought uh harry conklin the singer uh did a phenomenal job uh with the crowd and uh uh they uh had just you know uh, such a responsive crowd there the people were just like going crazy for them um they were at the top of their game on stage uh they were so much fun and uh Sorcerer and them both had like really, really, really good sound. Yeah, I was really upset that I missed them because like I remember how energetic they were uh, at that very first Prog Power. And mind you, I'm a little short dude, and and so is Harry, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so was that stage at JJ Kelly's uh, where Prog Power One <laughs> took place. So. I really didn't get to see a whole lot. I saw, like, the top of Mark Briotti's head, and I saw, like, the top of Chris Broderick's head because he was with Jack Panzer at the time. And, and like, I, I had to, like, experience them because they played an early set that day, too. They must, I think they played at about 1 or 2 o'clock. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, like, I got there late because I suck at getting out of bed. And uh, But, like, I felt all that energy coming from the stage all the way from the back of that tiny little room. And uh, and then the next time I saw them was when they were touring with uh, In Flames and Iced Earth. Uh, so that would have been about a year later. And, um, and I remember that tour. Yeah. Did you see that show? Yes, I did in Harpo's in Detroit. Oh, wow. And man, they were spot on back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw that at the back room in Austin. And, uh, and honestly, like... I, I, I thought all three bands were great, but like Jag Panzer really, really, really nailed it for me that night. Um and a lot of it had to do with like the, the chemistry between Mark and Chris and the way that Harry commands the crowd. He is such a great front man and a really, really great guy too. I got to interview him that night and we talked for about an hour. I missed in flames because of him, so I can't really say how great they were that night. But uh but he was a really, really great dude, and I also have to, I also have to speak to, uh, to your point about Mark being a positive presence in the metal scene. I agree one hundred percent. At the time, I had a web zine called Burn the Sun, and uh, and he, I remember that he like posted on our freaking what, what were those things called back then? This was in the early two thousands. Guest books. He like posted on our guest books, and he shared links and stuff. Um, you know, and he was always really, really supportive of. You know, not just the bands in his genre, but bands in other genres, and just the scene in general. And uh, yeah. and I was always very grateful for that. And uh, and I finally got to tell him thank you because I'd never met him. I never had the opportunity to meet him or talk to him uh, until they did their signing session last week. 
and I finally got to tell him face to face, hey man, uh, I you know I love what you do with music, but I also love the way that you engage with the scene. I love how supportive you are of just metal in general, and uh, and thank you for supporting the scene, and thank you for supporting my old website. And he's like, oh, I remember that website. That was a cool site. Here, you want a cookie? <laughs> Yes, you gotta love a band that smashes you with metal and then gives you a cookie. <laughs> that was a brilliant marketing scheme. Heavy metal cookies. All right, y'all ready to move on to Caligula's Horse? Ah, uh, yes. Hell yes, hell yes, hell yes. Okay, I think you're gonna kick off that discussion. All right, so Caligula's Horse is the reason I bought tickets for days three and four. Demons and Wizards, cool. You know, all these other bands, cool. But then I saw Caligula's horse, even in that number three spot. And I knew that Atlanta would be my destination. With a relatively small discography for such talented musicians that have had so many projects before, Caligula's horse delivers a depth and complexity to their music that comes out of a surprisingly robust progressive metal scene of Australia. So many legendary prog metal bands are springing up out of the land down under. And this was Caligula's horse first foray into the United States, which they learned makes them sell out shirts. They only printed a hundred prog power shirts. <laughs> they sold out in less than an hour after doors. I'm surprised they lasted that long. Yes. And wow. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so, I was so emotional during their set. Did you I just go had... full fangirl on us right there? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'm sorry. But when it comes to live performances, you either have a very highly polished, well-performed, well-rehearsed set, or you have an organic, interactive band. That's at least my experience in the shows that I've been to. But somehow, frontman Jim Gray and the rest of Caligula's Horse managed to blend these two styles for a polished yet organic performance. This included multiple interactions with the crowd, call and response with people talking up to him, making (laughs) jokes about himself, rather self-deprecating jokes, which everyone had a good laugh at, but at the same time, dancing to his songs, hitting each note sharply with focus, not missing a single beat, asking the audience to sing along with him and letting them carry the performance as he focused on his next cue. Between the complexity of the music that they were playing but yet with the seemingly easy and um, very fluid delivery, made their set something very special. It seemed like they were meant to be up on that stage, but at the same time, like they didn't feel like it made them any different. They were speaking to the audience as though we were right up there with them. And after the show, they were interacting with the fans with so much gratitude and so much humility. And, between the execution of their set, the absolute stunning... You couldn't look away from the stage with the way they performed, the way that they engaged with the crowd. It made that set one of the most special of the night for me. I am actually not the biggest fan of them. Uh, I really wanted for their performance to be what sold me on them. And... uh, I I thought they were very good and they really did make it look effortless and they were full of energy and uh, Jim Gray's voice is like so gorgeous. Uh, I was actually a fan of Arcane, the other band that he was in. Um, and and I, their, I their guitarist the... was also in that project. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Arcane. Super great. Loved it. Yeah. yeah very cool stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I thought that, uh, they they really did give a really really good performance. I I still didn't fully get into it, and I, I it's probably on me. I felt like they put on a great show, and the crowd absolutely loved them. Uh, I felt like technically wise with the sound, I felt like like Jim's voice was a little low in the mix. Um, the guitar seemed kind of high, and he seemed kind of low in the mix. But he has a very as 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 like dynamic as he can make his voice he also kind of has kind of a delicate voice so maybe that had something to do with it 
but I, I enjoyed the show. I wanted it to be the show that made me go, oh, wow, these guys are amazing, and I love these guys, and it didn't happen, but I still had a good time. So, so Samantha mentioned the way that uh, Jim was interacting with uh, with the audience, and I'm on board 100% with that. The guy's really understated and really self-deprecating, but, uh, but he's also really... Uh, disarming in a way that he can just kind of like be up on stage and kind of in an aw shucks manner make jokes about himself and still really really win the crowd over uh just by talking smack about himself it, it was it was really charming um i was really really taken aback by how good he sounds live um i'm not a huge fan of like of like too much falsettoing uh especially in metal i know that a lot of uh you know, a lot of gent bands do those kinds of vocals, and like, I'm just not a huge fan of that. Uh, it's kind of like, it's like you know, bringing that that airy like Art Garfunkel, John Anderson t- uh, vocal style into something really, really heavy. Just, just for me, causes an imbalance most of the time. Um, and like, like on their new album, on their most recent album, In Contact, I think that's most obvious. On the the hands are the hardest. I love that song but I just can't dig the vocals. They didn't play that song live. However, um, Jim really, really, really shone uh, on that album, or um, on that performance uh, when he was actually singing because because when he sings rather than falsettos, he does have a really, really great voice. And uh, and I think one of y'all described his voice as beautiful. Yeah, you're kind of right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to agree with you on that point. Um now, uh, Matt, you and I were seated right next to each other towards the end of their set. Uh, did you notice that my eyes started watering up when they played Graves at the very end? Uh, no, I was I was paying pretty close attention to their set. Actually, I was trying trying very hard. <laughs> yeah, I remember that you walked away. I thought you couldn't handle me being emo. I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, okay. No, seriously, like there's something about that uh about that hook, about that melody, uh that recurring theme in the song Graves that every time I hear it when I'm driving or when I'm running or whatever, it just sends chills down my spine. And when I heard it live, my eyes watered up. You know, and mm. and come for that to happen at a metal fest. I don't care, you know? I don't care. I'm going to let it happen anyway. That song moves me, and hearing it live moved me even more. That's great. That was another comment of mine, is that for a band with songs that average somewhere around the six, seven, eight-minute runtime, they made absolute fantastic use of a one-hour set. They packed in a variety of styles across their entire discography, including a song that's almost 15 minutes long. And that took real skill to be able to not only have that interaction with the audience, but not run out of time to showcase these long, very, very proggy songs without getting weighed down. And I think that was another very technical advantage on their part. I think that just made the show all that much more special. I think he had the best stage banter of the weekend because he was so entertaining just standing there and making fun of himself and making fun of you know, the, the situation or, or just rolling with the audience yelling back at him. He genuinely enjoys the interaction. And that was a really cool change of pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that they recently toured Australia with crap. Who was it? Noble of Ascaris or something. There were just like all these luminaries. Um, Yeah. Who else? I'm pretty sure it was Noble of Ascaris I'm pretty sure Voyager went too. Oh man! I told you, the Australian prog metal scene is absolutely nuts, dude. Like, if they were to hit the road in the United States with Psychroptic, I would <laughs> shit my pants. Please don't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do it around you. Don't worry. I certainly wouldn't do it at center stage. <laughs> somebody was. I doing knew that. somebody was stinking it up down there. Hey, man, you smelled it, you dealt it. All right. Up next, the oddball band of the weekend, Poets of the Fall. Oh, man, who wants to start on this one? Okay, nobody's taking the bait, so I'm going to call Alexa out. <laughs> I'll try him. Um, I thought that they were a welcome change of pace. Like, um, if Barren Earth was the palate cleanser, I just, like, I don't know. Like, this, this wasn't a band that I was expecting to get to see at Prague Power, but this is a band that I actually would want to see. 
um, in general. And I thought it was really interesting to see a band that no doubt sells really big. I'm assuming they sell really big venues out in Finland, in Europe, to play this show in the U.S. on the stage they played. Um, it was fantastic to just see their stage presence, um, to see them just like really excited to perform. And I thought they really respected the audience regardless of size. Um, and it was just looking at the crowd dancing along. Like this was a band where like I was dancing along with my friends and we were having a great effing time. Um, they played a pretty good variety of songs. They didn't play my two favorites by them, which is kind of a bummer, but that's what the live CD is for. Right. So are you um, talking about broken glass? I was, I'm talking about kamikaze love and delicious. I love those songs. Um, I, I love them. I just feel like they're like really awesome driving songs. They're good gym songs. I like they're Stairmaster songs. I just like they're fun songs to me. Um, but just to see the whole crowd and I, I saw Glenn um, rocking out like up against like the like in the photo pit as well. And it was just a band where like, you know, you're having a great time with your friends and everyone seems to be enjoying it. And I thought that was a really special moment. Um, so I, I loved that I got to saw to, to, uh, to see them. Um, and I was also very impressed that they were out in the courtyard after later that night with the fans, which is not something that I was expecting to see from that band. Now, you sound like one of those rare people that was actually familiar with them before they got announced for uh, for Pog Yes. War. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, and I just, it's not like, I mean, I mean, I heard the uh, Carnival of Rust and I enjoyed that. Um, and one of my Finnish friends sent it to me. And they're like, hey, this band, whatever, they're popular. Maybe you would like this. And um, I did enjoy it. And so, I mean, I've listened, you know, through, um, I'm trying to think of their most current album. It's called Violet or what's Ultra it? Violet. Ultra Ultra Violet. Violet. I really enjoyed that. And I actually um, had been listening uh, to it at work um, a lot, just like in the background, like doing my little admin tasks at work, trying not to go crazy. And so like, I really enjoyed this band. It's a, it's a fun band. Um, it was interesting to see them play, um, where they did in that lineup. Um, it just seemed like a very heavy end of the end of the festival. So it was just interesting how they, they were placed there, but I, I loved it. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, placement wise, uh, they were kind of, yeah, a, a an oddball placement, but, uh, I thought it really worked. Um, in January, uh, I would not have gone to see this band. I would have taken a dinner break. Um, but, uh, come like February, uh, I was like, oh, I better start checking out these bands that I don't really know. And, uh, I just let YouTube play one song after another for me from Poets of the Fall. And I really started getting into some of their songs and, uh, YouTube was pretty accurate about half of their set list. And, uh, evidently, uh, uh, one of my friends said, oh, they're a singles band like as opposed to an album oriented band, they're a band that produces, you know, one or two really good songs on an album. They have a lot of albums, so they have a lot of good songs. So uh, I felt like it was a really <laughs> fun time. <laughs> uh, I and, agree. Uh, I thought I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just, it was a, it was a party that singer. He is phenomenal. He is a world-class rock singer. And uh, seeing him up on the stage and the whole band putting on a really great, highly entertaining show. It was not the kind of thing you expect at Prog Power. They were probably more of a of an oddball band than any of the other bands there. But I mean, that's because Glenn absolutely loves them. Um, but I feel like we kind of got a treat. It was like seeing, you know, uh, I don't know, Stone Temple Pilots or somebody like that. Somebody, a, a really fantastic rock band who are at the top of their game. Um, but they're more sophisticated than a band like that. So they're really a very special treat for us. Something very different. At the same time, it was so strange to see a musician on stage who had short hair, no piercings, and no tattoos. I didn't know what to make of that. <laughs> uh, for me, they were the best performers of the weekend. Nobody wow. else. Nobody else looked as comfortable on stage as those guys did. Nobody else was engaging with the audience without the benefit of having a microphone in their hands like those guys were. I've never, I don't remember the last time I saw somebody just rock out and just completely like 
lose themselves in their performance the way those guys did that weekend. And uh, and like and these guys were not afraid to show off their skills. They just don't feel the need to do it in every single song. When when there's an yeah. instrumental break and those guys started soloing and dueling each other, I was impressed by their shredding ability. They just don't do it yeah. because most of the time it just isn't necessary. That instrumental was bad. Yes. I was very impressed. Yes. Those guys won me over. And and that bass player, man, watching that bass player was a joy. I you know, that was one of the highlights of my Saturday. And I say that having spent a half an hour on the bus with Hansi Kirsch. <laughs> <laughs> band number five, the penultimate band of Prague Power Twenty. Brian, you still there? Sure, yes. Sir. Brian, Brian, you're a threshold fan, aren't you? Yeah, um I saw them uh the last time they were at Prague Power. Uh and um th- this this is like one of those water the the watermark bands like this is the band that if you're into Prague Power USA you should know about them. It, it's like um uh, what's the term? Not SOP, but uh, like a standard operating procedure for Prague Power. You should listen to them. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I didn't realize that they were kind of broken up and then kind of reformed, uh, which, which is still really cool. But I, I seriously haven't I seriously haven't listened to any of their material in years. So when they when they came back, I'm like, okay, perfect. And I kind of forgot almost all their music. It's been so long since I listened to them. Matt, you have been a long time Threshold fan, no? Yeah, uh, since the uh, first album, Wounded Land, way back in the day. Yeah. Okay, and you've seen them twice before, each time with a different singer. Uh, how'd they hold up this time? Uh, fantastically. They were they were really really great. Um, each time I've seen them, they've been really really great. Uh, they're despite having a different singer every time they've just been really consistently excellent. I I'm sure I listened to Psychedelic Tessin the uh, the first album with Glenn Morgan the, which was their actually their second album um back in the day. I listened to it but I don't own it. But yet when I got Legend of the Shires and was listening to it I was like wow this guy not only does this guy like really match their sound really 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 well. He's a great singer. He also sounds a lot like Mac. So I felt like he was a really, really good match for the band and how lucky for them to be able to get him, bring him in um, so that they could play all these songs that were that probably, you know, I love Damien Wilson. I absolutely he's one of my very favorite singers. But the songs with Mac, Damien Wilson has such a different texture to his voice than Mac did. I felt like. Glenn Morgan did better justice to those songs than uh, Damian Wilson did in terms of making them sound like their album versions, making them have that, that, that punchy aggression. And Damian, Damian Wilson has got this clear, crisp, beautiful voice, but he doesn't really, if, if he tries to get aggressive, he sounds kind of strident. Um, whereas uh, Mac and, and Glenn Morgan like have a very like rock, aggressive style to their voices that really work. But he was also really humble. The other, the other two threshold singers kind of had a bit of a rock starry sort of persona. Um, and he felt like he was more just humble and up on stage and very grateful to be there. Uh, he was kind of like, felt like he kind of was what drew everybody else in the band together. He was a focal point. It didn't feel like he was addressing the audience. He almost felt like he was a part of the audience who just happened to be on stage. I got that kind of vibe from him. Yeah. He, he was a very adept singer. He was a very adept performer. You know, it, it was interesting that he wasn't playing guitar while he was singing. I guess he can't do that. But, but like, you know, just watching him pick up the guitar every now and then and just kind of like wail away along with the other guy. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a threshold noob. I know that it shouldn't be, but I am. <laughs> so I don't know everybody's names. But like watching him just like, you know, pick, the, pick up the guitar every now and then, shred, put it back down, continue singing, which he does both very, very well. That, that that was a cool thing to see. It was it was it was something a little different. But like the the highlight for me, um, besides stars and satellites, that song's just cool. Um, the highlight for me was their drummer. Uh, I think his name is Johannes. Johan James. Yeah. Oh, that guy is so good. He is fantastic. He's a monster. Yeah, he was, that guy was incredible. Yeah. 
every time, every time he is just so freaking good. He's a consummate showman. If he's not playing, he is doing a pantomime for the audience and stealing the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that dude was all smiles the whole time. And I understand that he was the left-handed drummer that we were talking about last time. Yeah, that's the drum set that needed to get swapped out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were three different drum changes that day. Yeah. But uh but yeah, like just watching that dude, uh somebody that's that much at ease uh with their instrument that is obviously playing just for the joy of music, uh, is really refreshing. You know, and I and I'm sure that that's something that that most if not all of the musicians that we uh that we saw uh last week, I'm I'm sure that's common with all of them, but when it's that obvious you know, it really is disarming. I love seeing that sort of thing. Richard West is the the keyboardist is pretty much my favorite prog uh, metal keyboardist. And the, the, I was disappointed that he was in the back because in the pre, the two previous shows, he was in the front. And that meant, you know, if he played a solo, you could actually see what he was doing. I felt like with him being in the back there, I mean, he's a very humble guy. He writes all of the lyrics to their music. Uh, he's very involved in uh, every aspect of their music. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he kind of was in the back and uh, I didn't really, couldn't really see, you know, his solos up close. I guess you can, unless the keyboard just pushes their keyboard so that the, the people can see it, you know, you never see anything except them. Uh, moving around on, on, on in front of the, the keyboards, but I felt like with him being in the back, I really couldn't see. That was my only complaint about the stage setup. Do you wish he'd had a guitar? I, 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 th I think Voyager <laughs> has that market corner. <laughs> I would love to see more keyboardists get more gimmicks on stage with their gear because the nature of the instruments obscures their their actual work on the instrument. You don't get to see it. Uh, yeah. I've seen a couple bands where the keyboardist had a stand for this keyboard where the, the, the keyboard was basically bolted to the stand and the base of the stand was one of those heavy uh, coil springs from a, a car's front end suspension. Oh yeah. So that he could bounce that keyboard forward and back and sideways. It just, it, it looked like he he mounted his keyboard on a seesaw and he could just bounce back and forth and just swing around. Yeah. And it, it's it's such a cool theater. thing. I want to see more keyboardists get cool gear on stage in order to be more dynamic and be more um visual. I think I saw some like nineties industrial type band do something like that. I want to say it was Gravity Kills or you know one of those bands do something like that on their keyboard stands where they were basically like kicking that thing around and it never came off the stand and it was cool. Uh I interrupted somebody. Who was that? Oh I was just trying to say that Dream Theater, they had a rotating platform for their keyboard. Yep. Yep. Jordan Rudess had his so he could spin around on stage. It was very cool. It was brilliant, and it made it just brought so much life to the stage. So it would be nice to see that with bands, as we were mentioning. You know, yeah. give them a little bit of spotlight. And he's also got, like, that innate joy of playing uh, on stage. I mean, you know, it really is a pleasure to watch him, not just for his abilities, but just for, like, watching him become one with his instrument. But, like, before I forget, uh, it's, I don't know her name, uh, but she's the keyboardist for Cradle of Filth, who has a really, really interesting interesting thing. It's, like, basically a semicircle. It looks like this arch that's in front of her, and that's her keyboard. I'm not sure how easy that thing is to play, but it looks cool. I've seen the uh, like the, the the sales brochure for that keyboard. I forget who makes it, and yeah, it's a curved keyboard. It's very weird. I don't know what the ergonomics would be for playing on that. It seems very weird or unnatural unless you spend a lot of time playing on just that keyboard to get your hands used to that. All right, we are at the last band of the festival. Uh, the big draw for a lot of people, Demons and Wizards. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Alexa, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Yeah, no, I am, I'm a little bit spoiled because I definitely saw them the week before in Seattle. Um, couldn't, no, I mean, like, how many times are you going to get to see Demons and Wizards live? Mm -hmm. um, I thought that that was definitely, like, the 
like the Prague power moment, I guess, with everyone going crazy chanting Hansi, Hansi. That was, I thought it was just kind of hysterical and a really fun way to end <laughs> um, the festival. And you could kind of tell that like this crowd was more blind guardian fans than iced earth fans. When I was in Seattle, you saw, I, I felt like there was a lot of like Merca and like bandanas and stuff. And like, those people must be from Oregon <laughs> or something, but, but like, because no, you kind of like got, it was more like Schaefer or Schaefer, but this was mm. more like Hansi, Hansi. Mm. And I'm down for that. Right. Like Hansi would be the number one on my ticket. Right. Schaefer would be the Veep Cause he's a little bit, you know, woo-hoo. Mm. but either way, yep. I thought it was, fantastic and i think hansi gets a lot of um shit if you will for not being as expressive on stage but the magic with him is like he's so subtle like his the way he looks at the audience or like looks at um the other folks on stage it's it's just subtle and he's he knows all the cues obviously and so i find that very entertaining and it's very cheeky so i find his stage presence very cheeky very clever um if that makes any sense and i was I was sitting up with my friends, just enjoying the end of the festival. Um, and it was just like, I totally teared up during Fiddler because a lot of stuff had happened mm-hmm. um, that week for me that were like a very big deal that a lot of things that were a very big deal to me. Um, and it was just really kind of cra- like surreal to be like, I'm sitting with my friends. I'm at Prague power. Holy shit. Like demons and wizards is on the stage. Uh, what is my life right now? Like I definitely had one of those moments um, the only thing I will say that, I mean, cause it, we can go in like track by track and it's, it's super awesome. But part of me hoped that Barlow would kind of like crawl on the stage for, I died for you because in New York, mm-hmm. the, the show prior to that, he came out exactly. and I had the, mm-hmm. and I had the misfortune of seeing this on my best friend's Instagram feed. And she was like crying and she was like, Alexa, Aww. Barlow, like just effing came out on stage. And I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. This could happen. And so my friends and I are like, oh my God, it could happen. And then somebody who knows Matt Barlow texted him and he's like, yeah, I'm definitely not in Georgia right now. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my God, what a bummer. But, um, you know, and I could see him you, doing that because like he's, you know, he's performed with Pyramids at Proc Power. Yeah, he's performed with he's Ashes of Aries at Proc Power. Yes, he is. This crowd he's loves beloved, Matt Barlow. He's a beloved performer. And so sue me. I love him. I think he's great. And um, I just, I don't know. I thought it was, a really fun experience to see them after seeing them like the week before. And just to, I think the magic of the crowd is what really stood out for me in that moment, because you really got to feel of like, this is what it means to see this band during Prague power, mm-hmm. as opposed to this is what it means to see a band when you're just going to a show on tour. And the, the set list was relatively similar to what they played when they were on tour. So I heard, I mean, pretty much there was no acoustic track out in Seattle. Um, but either way, it was like, just to hear the crowd, like, just kind of like, you know, not begging Hansi for more, but just like singing, you know, Valhalla. Like that was just like, Oh my God, like, where am I? Like I'm in the twilight zone of awesomeness. And so (laughs) that was a very, it was a very sweet way to end the festival. I think. Matt, your turn. Uh, first, uh, that should be the, uh, the subtitle of this episode. The Twilight Zone of Awesomeness. Yeah. <laughs> Taken. I'm an old school Iced Earth fan, and I'm a huge Blind Guardian fan. And I remember when the first Demons and Wizards album came out, I was super excited about it. And then I listened to it, and I really, I didn't really love all of it. I liked some of it, but didn't love all of it. And finally, years later, the second one came out, and I'm a huge uh, uh dark tower fan the the topic of the of the album most of it is uh references to stephen stephen king's dark tower series Mm -hmm. and uh, that helped me get more into them as a band but i was still i've always just felt like oh you know i love how grandiose and and complicated blind guardian is and after matt barlow left iced earth i pretty much tuned out of iced earth so uh, it was always kind of a thing where, oh, you know, this is an ingredient that I'm not as into anymore, and it's being tossed into this thing that I really like, Blind Guardian. But uh, I came to the show with an open mind, kind of exhausted by the end of uh, just two days of shows. I, I know people do four days. 
Um, but I was pretty tired by, by the, the end of the day, but I felt like they put on an absolutely phenomenal show. And uh, even songs that I did not like previously, uh, I felt like they, they did such a good job that I really enjoyed even those show, those songs. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just had a really, really, really good time. I thought they were phenomenal. Uh, the crowd, the crowd clearly had so much love for the band and yeah, that was, that was an exceptional thing. I don't know that like you would necessarily get that at, at a normal show, but this was, this was the prog power crowd and you see them do this for other bands sometimes where they just, there's so much love in, in, in the, in center stage. And, uh, yeah, it, it can like bring, bring the band to tears you know, to see, to see it. Uh, it was really very moving and also very, very silly. Um, I, I, I couldn't help but laugh after, you know, he, it seemed like he had gotten them to calm down a little bit and then it came right back. Nope. <laughs> there was no calming down this crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Samantha, did you catch demons and wizards? Heck yeah, I did. Okay. What are your thoughts? My thought is that as much as we've talked about, crowd pleasing shows tonight I don't think I've ever seen a crowd want a band as much as the prog power crowd wanted demons and wizards Mm -hmm. the second that Hansi stopped speaking people were screaming all together for more more Hansi, more Schaefer more Valhalla it was constant and in that moment with everyone's voices joined as one the passion The true love for the music, the love for the art, it was so present in the crowd. That wanting and then that absolute celebration of the music as it existed. To me, that made it was a very, very beautiful and encompassing way to end the show end the festival. And they deserved that spot. They deserved that headline spot because they owned that stage and they had the audience in the palm of their hands. They said, jump. We said, how high? Pretty much, pretty much. Okay, I've got a few things that I want to say, and then I want Brian to take us out on Demons and Wizards because I'm sure he's got something very uh, colorful to say about it because that's Brian. Um, so, like, I've seen Blind Guardian a number of times, uh, and Hansi's always sounded good, but I never, ever have I heard him sound the way that he did Saturday Night with Demons and Wizards. Um, It's worth noting that when I got onto their bus to interview him, the entire bus smelled like hot ginger tea, (laughs) which is exactly what Hansi was sipping because he's, you know, he's not as young as he used to be. He's in his 50s now and he still sings like that for a living. He needs to take care of his voice more than he did when he was in his 20s and he's been doing that and My God, it's been paying off. I've never heard him sound. Those screams that he was doing should not come out of the throat of someone his age that's been singing like that for over 30 years. That just shouldn't happen. This is wrong. This is unnatural. I don't care how it happens. It's ginger tea. It's Satan. Who cares? He needs to keep doing it because his (laughs) voice has never been stronger. I'm glad somebody else was just that too. Uh, now I remember when last year when they were announced the excitement that overtook the entire uh, the the entire auditorium transferred outside. There was a group of guys I don't remember who they were. I probably recognize them if I were to see them, but they were in a circle, like just kind of dancing around like do- lunatics chanting, "We got demons, we got wizards, we got demons, we got wizards," and they started doing that in between songs <laughs> during yeah, the I show. Oh man, I laughed so freaking hard. I mean, like that. Like I, I have never, ever seen so much joy and so much aggression fused together into one palpable thing in any situation ever before in my life. I don't know what it was. I don't know how they did it, but the way that Demons and Wizards just owned not just the stage but the entire audience. You know, they freaking own the place. I've, I have never seen a performance that energetic. And that aggressive and that full of adrenaline in that venue. And mind you, I don't. I lost track of how many uh, bands I've seen in that auditorium. But my God, I I I was left speechless. I was dumbfounded. And and like and mind you, the place was full the entire time. Like there have been times where the headliner would play to like a half empty uh, auditorium simply because people are tired after four days of you know metal and stupidity. 
That didn't happen for Demons and Wizards. That place was full. Brian, you go. Okay, I'm going to be very specific in this uh, in this kind of um, pedigree of prog power performances. Ed Guy, when they first performed. Sabaton, when they first performed. Brainstorm, when they first performed. Um, th- these were these were bands that 100% conquered the audience. Nobody in the audience could say, ah, I didn't like it. You, you know, whether you were there to see them specifically or where, whether you were just hanging out and then realized, oh my God, this is really good. There are very select bands that have gone out on stage and absolutely conquered the entire venue all at once without any doubt. And I mean, it, it, all weekend long, I never realized how many uh, how many band shirts belonged to a particular band of the night. This is this was overwhelmingly that there were so many Demons and Wizards shirts on for the Saturday night. I mean, I'm even comparing that to people getting ready to see um, Pain of Salvation or Devin Townsend or, or um, uh, Gamma Ray. You know, when when they've performed where the audience definitely wanted to see that band that night. But Demons and Wizards had easily the most ready audience to to see the show. So many people were there to specifically see Demons and Wizards. My brother and I got into Iced Earth when the Dark Saga came out because that album was based off of Spawn, a comic book that my brother had found out and, and was following. So it's like, okay, this is an album by uh, uh, somebody, oh, Ice Earth, never heard of it. Spawn's on the cover. Let's see what it sounds like. And we're sitting there going, what the hell is this? It's brilliant. You know, then <laughs> Something Wicked This Way Comes mm-hmm. is released, and then we just became Ice Earth fans. Demons and Wizards happened. We found out about that, and I didn't know who Blind Guardian was at the time. That's how I got introduced to Blind Guardian. Wow. And then I started doing my research. I'm like, wait, they got an album about the Silmarillion? Oh. <laughs> they made a whole career out of Tolkien. <laughs> the, the, the Silmar- and then I started becoming a fan of Blind Guardian through through uh, Nightfall and Middle Earth. And, and yeah. my brother and I have been waiting 19 years to see this fucking band. We 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 were like so needed to see this band. This was definitely bucket list stuff, and we're putting that up there with Dream Evil. We want to fucking see Dream Evil just as much as we've wanted to see fucking Demons and Wizards. And last year, when the announcement was made over the PA, my brother was really on the fence about coming. He's like, ah, I don't know any of these bands. Nothing's really triggering anything, and. He said it before the video played. He goes, you know what, guys? Uh, unless unless it's Demons and Wizards, I'm not coming back next year. <laughs> it gets announced. Uh, it gets announced, and he, louder than the audience screaming, cheering for that, I hear my brother singularly go, "Fuck!" <laughs> Just <laughs> gotta get one ticket. <laughs> and he specifically flew down Saturday morning. And then took it like 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 okay I'm I'm here like usual, uh, you know finances get in the way you know family obligations schedules all kinds of stuff make it difficult to come down to the festival every single year. I can't believe I've made it eighteen times, and I treat this as the the one uh, uh, luxury I have in life is this vacation this moment throughout the through the year to just say it everything else goes to the back burner. I need to see this stuff. And he's, you know, my brother's no longer really uh, 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 that free to, to get down to Prague part all the time. He's might not come down next year. He's kind of on the fence again. There wasn't anything announced that he was like, Oh yeah, I gotta see all, I gotta see this, but I've never seen him so ready to, to attend a Prague power as it was once Stevens and wizards was announced. Is like okay, I gotta come down. I, there's there's no chance in hell I'm gonna miss this, you know. Get cancer again? He's still gonna fucking go. He doesn't give a. Shit. He needed to see that show, and all of us sat up there and just, man, we were focused on that fucking show. Man, we were we were so focused on how 
good they were. And like you said, Hansi's voice was flawless. I'm glad I'm not the only one noticing that he hit everything. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a couple of the, of, uh, the tours where he just sounded awful. It didn't even sound like him, mm -hmm. you know, just voice burnt out from too many days on the road. Uh, or even Dude, like, they, a, um, they were closing out the tour on this. This was the last, uh, the, the last show of the tour. He should not have sounded that good. Yeah. Um, like, uh, uh, the live album, um, Blind Guardian Live. There's a couple of tracks on there where he's not singing the notes the way you were expecting him to sing them. You know, sing either an octave below or just changing the the vocalish, vocalization of the uh, the the lines so that he can keep it within his comfortable range. No, nah, man, not not this night. He he hit everything exactly the way it was supposed to be, and even the even the Ice Earth songs that he did were perfect it's wrong how good they were that night yeah he did kind of make them his own didn't he absolutely I, I, if 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 uh Stu block had to step away for a tour get hansi on the phone make yep. him tour with ice earth i'd yep. fucking love it yep <laughs> I'm obviously not nearly as passionate about Demons and Wizards as you and Roger are, and I did spend much of the Demons and Wizards set tending after a friend that had a bit much to drink. Uh, that Neither of those two um, significant factors <laughs> deterred me from enjoying the hell out of that set. Well, I mean, like, enjoy isn't even the right word. I was... I, I was... Yo, dude, I was shaken... Like, I was, like, verifiably shaken. I was not expecting to be slammed like that the way that God. I was. Like, oh, I mean, yeah. like, I knew that they would be good. I did not expect that. And that <laughs> is going... I, that is a prog power performance for the ages. Not exaggerating yeah. there. Yeah, that that is one for the ages. Yeah, I'm putting that up there. I mean, the the... Evergrey show with two wedding proposals on stage. That's that's how fucking perfect that show was. There are there are the the uh, Prague Power Tens um, All Star Jam, the, the Crimson the the Glory festival. Show, the with, like, Glory with like seventeen thousand guest singers. You know, <laughs> yeah, legendary uh, performances. Peyton's mind recording their double live album at at Prague Power a couple of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. You need a list of all the magical moments that have taken place on that stage. I mean, there have okay. just been there have been so many. There have been so many that it's impossible to keep track. You know, but uh, but yeah, there has been a lot of magic on that stage. Yeah, you know, and and yeah, we've only got five more years left of it. And let's make it special. <laughs> but I, yeah. I think they're going to be pretty loaded. Pretty mm -hmm. the, the deck is going to be fully loaded for those for those years. It's going to be no way that. Glenn's going to do anything except get such satisfaction for all of us. You know, I there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to, going to take the festival out on a high note. I'm excited to see what that high note is. Mm -hmm. And I'm also kind of uh -huh. terrified. Because <laughs> I don't know if uh, I can handle that much awesome. I really don't. <laughs> Whatever he well, comes up, it's going to be special. We're finally going to get an incarnation of Rhapsody. I mean, how no, many There had already been one, no? Okay, we, we had this discussion in the pit. How many Rhapsodies have there been? About 50. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but this is probably the closest we're going to get to the OG. Like, realistically. Which incarnation was it last right. time? It was okay. Terilli's Rhapsody. It was Terilli and a bunch of other non-Rhapsody guys, right? I think so. Like yeah. Well, yeah. if by nature they would be Rhapsody, because, but I know what you mean. Like, <laughs> it's it feels like you got to have a whole family tree for them, quite honestly. <laughs> but I think it's one of those Wikipedia pages where you see the current members and then former members, and the former members list is going to be three screens long. Just because of how many <laughs> all those colored out. bars overlap. <laughs> yeah, kind of like the history of Ice Earth or the history of um, uh, uh, Rage or Refuge. Oh God. Yeah. Uh, so, so like I I know that I'm not the only person in this boat but like I'm I'm not a Rhapsody fan. I stopped listening to them to them in the early 2000s just cuz I lost interest in that kind of metal. However, 
what I heard in the uh, in the announcement video, whatever that was, whatever that's really uh, it's really Leone Rhapsody song that was sounded excellent. I you it know, did sound pretty cool. Yeah, and like I've heard a lot of people uh, sing the praises of that album, but they've all been power metal fans, and that's just not my thing. What I heard at that announcement video makes me curious. I think I might go check out my first Rhapsody album since Dawn of Victory. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, real quick, before we wrap things up, I do want to go over the so the roster for next year. So far, Wednesday, it's been announced that Powercrest will headline upstairs. Or, I'm sorry, is it is it going to be upstairs in the loft? Right? Yes. The loft. yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So All that's... of Magic Never Dies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of people are really excited about that. I am a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you must be excited. Absolutely. I, oh my gosh, when I heard that announced, I, I just could feel my heart leap in my chest because Power Quest was pretty much my, one of my doorways into power metal. It was so accessible. It was so vibrant. Prog Power is the only ones that have ever gotten them to the US. They hardly even tour in Europe anymore. So to have that get pulled off and have such an exclusive set makes next year look incredibly appetizing and makes my wallet cry in fear. Now, I, I think that the last time there was a midweek show there must have been in 09. And and that was pretty special, too. It was the Texas-based uh, Queensryche tribute band Mind Crime. Um, yes. Mm-hmm, yes. Playing all of Operation Mind Crime with, uh, what's her name, Pamela Moore herself. Pamela Moore, yeah. Yeah. That was... That- that was Spine special. Chilling. So, like, some people are pretty are pretty concerned that because the Wednesday night show is getting moved upstairs, that it's not going to be quite as special. Uh, I call bullshit on that because no, it's going to be it's going to be way more intimate. intimate. Yes, yes, and and I don't think I need to remind anybody that that mind crime performance was special. I mean, like, I know it sounds lame. Oh, they're just a Queen's Rock tribute band. Yo, you weren't there. Okay. I was there. Matt, were you there? I was not there. Oh, dude, you missed out. Brian. I've never I've never seen Chris Salinas do do Queen's Rock. And it it's very frustrating to me. (laughs) Dude, (laughs) Dude, straight up, dude. It was better than the real thing. Especially at the time, it was better than seeing the real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen uh, Queensrÿch. Oh, I'm sorry, not, uh, the Jeff Tate Queensrÿch experience come through the his Operation Mind Crime, and I was let down because he's just not even trying to hit the notes that he used to hit anymore. But it's, Chris it, Salinas hit them, mm-hmm. and with a wink in his eye, he was. Fucking mm-hmm. on. Yep. Yep. San Antonio boy right there. Makes me proud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, if anybody's concerned that just because it's getting moved uh, upstairs that it's not going to be special. Yeah. You don't need to worry <laughs> about that. Um, so it's nothing... a good venue. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's where they still do the acoustic shows when they do that. Last year it was Labyrinth. And, man, I'm really glad I was there. That, um, I yeah. wish that would have got reported. Yeah, yeah. I I, I wish that had been filmed. Uh, let's see. Nothing yet has been announced for uh, for Thursday night. Uh, though I've heard some pretty interesting rumors coming down the pike. Uh, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to get murdered. Uh, let's move on to day three. The headliner for Friday next year is going to be Conception. Uh, that got a lot of people excited. I'm uh, fucking ready for Conception again. I think Brian's ready for conception again. Uh, Jeff Scott Soto, uh, formerly of Ingve Momstein's band and several other bands, and currently also with the Sons of Apollo, is going to do a, a, a bunch of Queen songs, uh, which 
I'm not used to seeing it, uh, so many covers uh, at uh, at a prog power performance, but this is Jeff Scott Soto. I'm looking forward to this. He is one of the greats of the past like 30 years. That dude's voice is untouchable. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. The Night Flight Orchestra. It's uh, if you're not familiar with it, imagine the bass player from Arch Enemy and the singer from Soil Work playing 80s style rock like Toto. It's it's a guilty pleasure for me. I should not like that kind of music, but I do. <laughs> and a lot of people are really excited to see those guys. Um, Eternal Tears of Sorrow and the band that I've been wanting to see at Prague Power for at least a year and a half now, freaking Witherfall. I'm so glad those guys are coming back. Now, that that's basically a duo. It's Joseph Michael and Jake Dreyer. We saw Joseph Michael this year with Sanctuary, and we saw Jake playing lead guitar for Demons and Wizards. Their last, uh, their last album was called A Prelude to Sorrow. It was my number one album for t- 2018. That album just kills. And then opening Friday will be Shattered Skies. Uh, the day four um, headliner is going to be To Really Leona Rhapsody. Isan is coming back for the first time since 2011. That's going to be awesome. Woo! The Gathering. You know, that that was unexpected because, like, you know, as much as the um, as much as Proc Power loves Annika von Giersbergen, Annika von Giersbergen hasn't been in the gathering in 13 years, but they've continued to put out really, really good material that that a lot of people just sadly aren't listening to because it's not Annika. I wish they would pay it attention because it's really good material. I'm really looking forward to seeing Celia. I honestly won't be surprised if Annika shows up for a couple songs. I didn't say that. Uh, Beast in Black. Thank you, Cyan. This is going to be awesome. And a Finnish group called Arion. A-R-I-O-N. Not the Dutch supergroup. <laughs> cool. So what are you guys looking forward to of next year? Um, Aishin. I've never heard it pronounced Aishin, but I'm glad that you said it that way because it was misspelled in the announcement video. Brian, your turn. Uh, Matt, who are you looking forward to seeing next year? I was one of the people that was somewhat a little bit let down by the announcements in part because I'm not that familiar with some of the bands. I feel like probably since I love Nevermore uh, and Witherfall gets compared to Nevermore a lot, maybe I would really like Witherfall. I need to give them a chance for the gathering. uh, I was a big fan like back in the day when they were very metal, but as they stopped being so metal, I stopped paying attention to them. And then I was like, oh, Anna, Annika left. Okay. She's still singing with the odd Arion project. That's great. I really, really love her voice. And yeah, I didn't, I, I knew that they had found another singer and I knew that they were occasionally putting out music, but I honestly didn't even know they were still together. So it was kind of surprising to me, but I mean, if they're still playing, I guess as an, for me, it would be kind of a nostalgia thing if they play some of those early songs. And uh, from the video, it seemed like she was very, very capable, very good singer. Um, maybe maybe that would work for me. And maybe if I listened to some of the new stuff, it, it seemed pretty interesting. It didn't seem like the, re- the weird experimental electronic rock that they were turning into, I guess, with like If Then Else and some of the other stuff towards the end of Annika's time with them. Um, I, I'm, I have a lot of open mind towards a lot of the bands, um, for next year. And, uh, I've been in this position before. I haven't gone to so many of them where there were years where I wasn't that psyched about the lineup in general. Um, but I found bands to really be into. And, uh, also, I mean, since it's kind of like a family reunion, you know, you can spend a lot of time with these people that you only see once a year who are you know, like people that you've been talking to for 20 something years and still have a wonderful time. Absolutely. Conception. I love the album flow front to back. It is an excellent album. It's all killer, no filler. And now that I know that conception is putting new material out, I need to hunt it down. Um, I know I'm going to love Jeff Scott Soto because that man can do no wrong. Uh, he, you could have him sing Beethoven and he'll do it justice and a half, you know, uh, he, you could, you could have him swing from chandeliers drunk and I'll probably still pay attention to him. <laughs> uh, I know I need to do my research on wood, on um, Witherfall. Um, I know I'm going to dig it. I just got to start studying. And I have a feeling Beast in Black is going to 
conquer the goddamn festival. I think they are going to go out there and and just 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 ruin people because nobody's really going to be ready for that. Now, the song that they played during the announcement video, to me, could best be described as disco metal. And, yeah, I was shaking my booty, and I don't have <laughs> much of one of those. <laughs> it most absolutely is. And there are some tracks that sound straight out of a video game soundtrack. They bring a very eclectic, poppy 80s mix into power metal. It's fun. You know, it's a good time. Cool. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up right there. Uh, We have lost Matt because technology doesn't always like to behave, and Alexa had to leave us some time ago. Uh, Brian in Detroit, dude, thanks so much for all your insight, dude, and for all your your funny stories. Anytime, every time. Maybe I'll get you up here in Detroit for a good show or two. Mm, Or maybe even a wedding. And Samantha... It's been such a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Samantha, thank you so much thank for joining you, thank us. Thank you. It's been a blast, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Yeah, I had a great time. Looking forward to it. All right, y'all. Well, that's it. We're calling it. Y'all have a good night. <laughs>